destroyed by Spartacus. Spartacus, a motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking, unlikely ever to be served in the tenderness. Soy Leonardo López Luján, miembro del Colegio Nacional y quisiera invitarlos a todos ustedes a asistir al ciclo de conferencias de Arqueología Hoy. Eh, para este año de 2020 hemos eh, preparado un riquísimo programa en el cual invitaremos a los protagonistas de la arqueología para que nos hablen de sus descubrimientos, no solo en México, sino en otras áreas como Guatemala, Perú y España. Eh, hemos eh, elaborado un programa muy interesante que irá desde las cabezas monumentales olmecas hasta los vasos funerarios hallados en las pirámides de las selvas mayas. También abordaremos la última tecnología que se aplica en la ciencia arqueológica. Entre otras técnicas, se platicará acerca del LIDAR, de los drones y cómo estas técnicas contribuyen a un mejor conocimiento de las civilizaciones antiguas. Eh, las conferencias tendrán lugar en el aula mayor del Colegio Nacional, aquí en la calle de Donceles, en el Centro Histórico de la Ciudad de México, y la entrada es libre. Los esperamos a todos. Muchas gracias.
cualquier pretexto es bueno para visitar el centro histórico de la Ciudad de México. Hay edificios maravillosos, rincones que usted jamás ha visto y desde luego hay sitios que son de visita obligada. Me refiero a el Colegio Nacional, un espacio donde se junta la inteligencia, la imaginación, el arte, la ciencia y algo muy bonito, la conversación y la amistad. En este edificio hay ahora un nuevo espacio. Es luminoso, es grato, es agradable y está el mejor amigo de usted, mío y de todos nosotros. ¿Sabe qué es? Un libro, muchos libros, una historia, muchas vidas, muchas vidas que van a enriquecer la nuestra. Vengan a visitar la librería del de Colegio Nacional. Spartacus. Spartacus, a motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking, unlikely ever to be served in the tenderness. Spartacus. Spartacus, a motion picture unequaled in the entire history of filmmaking, unlikely ever to be served in the tenderness.
Está bien. Tengo el costumbre de dar vueltas. Entonces, díganme. Ya puede pasar. Sí. The presentation of James Edward, who is going to talk about Euler, Heisenberg Lagrangian, and the asymptotic behavior on uh, QED. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the warm welcome and for the invitation. First, please allow me to pass on apologies from Christian Schubert, who has been unable to join us today. So he's asked me to give his talk for him and very kindly passed on his uh, slides. So I'm using his slides. As a basis for this talk, I've just allowed myself the liberty of modifying them slightly to pull them towards uh, our shared research interests. So I will stick with Christian's proposed topic of the asymptotic behavior of QED. And in particular, I will be discussing QED in the presence of a background electromagnetic field. And our main tool for doing so will be via the so-called Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian. And I'm hoping to share what we can learn about perturbation theory by analyzing this object. So allow me to begin by introducing the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian. The story begins in 1936. Euler and Heisenberg studied the quantization of QED in the presence of a constant electromagnetic background field. Uh, they did this for spinner QED, and they were able to work out the one-loop effective action. So I've given that here, written in terms of an integral representation. It's called the proper time representation for reasons that will become clear. And in the same year, Weisskopf gave an analogous formula for scalar QED. These one-loop effective actions essentially encode the nonlinear corrections to the Maxwell uh, field theory that arise due to interactions between photons and uh, electrons or scalar particles. So this will essentially be a function of the Maxwell invariance. So the magnetic field B and the electric field can be combined into these two invariants. And these are the parameters that enter this integral. So this uh, effective Lagrangian will tell us something about the nonlinear propagation of photons due to their coupling to uh, spinner or scalar fields. And we'll use those as the basis for the rest of this talk. So let me try to give you a more physical interpretation of those mathematical formulae. We usually represent the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian by this double line, which is designed to indicate the propagation of a virtual electron or scalar particle. It moves along a closed trajectory, a closed loop, and it will do so in proper time t, which is the parameter of integration from the previous slide. And I can give a diagrammatic representation of this Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian as follows. It essentially contains information about photon scattering amplitudes. So here you have photons coupled to a virtual electron loop. 
And you can see that this contains information about an arbitrary number of photons coupled to that loop. One thing to keep in mind is that it does so in the limits that these photon energies are small, and this is due to the fact that we're studying the quantization of these fields in the presence of constants, electromagnetic backgrounds. Aside from the diagrammatic representation, of course, as, as theorists, we would like to give a mathematical uh, formulation of these objects. And I'm doing that here at the bottom. So one can expand the Lagrangian as a double series in powers of the Maxwell invariance with these coefficients. And these coefficients essentially contain the dynamical information about each of these diagrams in turn. And as is noted at the bottom, if we make a minor change of variables, we can actually connect these series to the amplitudes for photons with fixed uh, helicities. And again, we would then be able to write those, uh, that expansion in terms of variables chi plus and chi minus, uh, representing the positive and negative helicity photons, uh, respectively. Okay, so physically, that's the kind of thing that the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian contains. Aside from that information, uh, something else that you can extract from the Lagrangian is information about the structure of the quantum vacuum. So as Lance mentioned this morning, the quantum vacuum is quite a complicated uh, object. In particular, it displays various nonlinearities, uh, such as birefringence and vacuum polarization. Moreover, if we take a region of space and we apply a strong electric field, it turns out that uh, the familiar vacuum as we know it is unstable. And so there is a process of vacuum decay which works in the following way. So we could think of the QED vacuum uh, not, a, uh, not as being empty space, but instead as being full of virtual particle antiparticle pairs. So these guys are popping into existence, they propagate, and they come together to annihilate. Okay, and this is what the quantization of the Dirac field or uh, the Klein Gordon field would tell us. And that's fine if you're working in vacuum, but if we turn on a background electric field, this story changes. Because a background electric field can have an effect precisely on these uh, virtual particles in the background. And they can supply energy to separate these particles over a macroscopic distance. And if they supply sufficient energy to overcome the rest mass threshold, it turns out that these uh, virtual particles, the electron and the positron, can become real. Now, we can connect this to the effective Lagrangian in the following way. I take the loop from the previous slide and I apply the optical theorem, which again, uh, thank you Lance for discussing that this morning. Cutting through this diagram opens up the double line. And then the double line is expanded in terms of an infinite number of interactions between the electron, the positron, and uh, photons from the background field. And you can see I'm trying to indicate that rather than traversing closed paths, these particles will become real. And so vacuum decay manifests itself as a real measurable flux of genuine on-shell particles out of a region of empty space over which we have applied uh, an electric field. So since the optical theorem relates these processes, we should be able to calculate explicitly from the effective Lagrangian something about the vacuum decay rate. And we can do that by examining the imaginary part of the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. Now our proper time integral is over this parameter t, and it turns out there are poles on the positive axis which generate an imaginary part to our Lagrangian. And if we sum over the positions of those poles, we calculate the residues, we can give the following series representations of the imaginary part of the spinner Lagrangian and the imaginary part of the scalar Lagrangian. And this reproduces a result that is uh, known from Schwinger's work in the early 50s. Uh, the vacuum decay rate will actually be directly proportional to these um, imaginary parts of the Lagrangians. And I want to just discuss a little bit the structure of these series. So let's look at the, the form of each uh, term in the series. Firstly, it's important to ask ourselves what does each term represent? So each uh, contribution to this series will represent the creation of a certain number of coherent electron-positron pairs within uh, Compton volume. And so going up as k gets larger, we're getting a contribution from the creation of more pairs. On the other hand, due to this factor beta in the denominator, which is related linearly to the electric field, 
It should be clear that for weak fields, this exponential factor will substantially decay, uh, pardon, will substantially suppress our decay rate. Moreover, with beta on the denominator, it's important to note that in fact the dependence of this imaginary part on the background field is non-perturbative in nature. And that is consistent with a description given by Sauter that uh, vacuum decay is essentially a tunneling process between an unstable vacuum and a state of lower energy. Okay, so I'd love to talk more about this, but I have to move on a little bit. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to look at the weak field limit. And in that limit, it turns out that only the k equals one term is really important. So we'll only take forward the first order term from this sum and the first order uh, exponent that arises. And here we have a slight problem, okay? Because what we'd really like to do is study amplitudes like this, okay? Where we have a certain number of photons from the background field supplying energy to our electron and our positron. But it turns out that since these photons are carrying vanishingly small energy, it would be impossible to overcome the rest mass threshold with a finite number of photons attached to these lines. And that motivates a study of the asymptotic behavior of these amplitudes in the limit of a large number of photons, which is what we will go on to do. Okay, so we first of all define the weak field expansion by simply expanding our effective Lagrangian in powers of the coupling to the electric field. And that uh, earns us certain coefficients, Cn. And since we need to look at this in the limit of a large number of photons, we are interested in the behavior of these coefficients as n tends to infinity. And it should be clear from this factorial growth of the coefficients that this series is, in fact, an asymptotic series. So we've immediately run into uh, uh, an important mathematical issue. However, there are techniques for dealing with asymptotic series in uh, quantum field theory. And if we use the Borel resummation technique, we can turn this weak field expansion and ex uh, extract the imaginary part of the Lagrangian in the limit that the strength of the field is uh, very small and we focus on the contribution from a large number of photons. And it turns out that the first order contribution from the Borel resummation exactly reproduces the first term in our series representation of the vacuum decay rate. So this is the first Schwinger exponent that I showed on the previous slide. And it's hopefully evidence to convince you that indeed it is uh, a diagram with a, an infinite number of photons which is reproducing the first term in our um, bare creation rate. Okay, so everything that I talked about so far has been at one loop order. Those were the original studies of uh, Euler and Heisenberg back in the 1930s. Since then, with work uh, really focusing between the 1970s and uh, year 2000, there has been an enormous worldwide effort to generalize their results to higher loop order. Okay, so going on to one loop order, the diagrammatic representation of the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian would look something like this. We still have our external photons, an arbitrary number of them coupled to our, our loop, but now we need to exchange a virtual photon between the electron-positron pair. Okay, so the aim is to calculate this Lagrangian, to apply the optical theorem to get access to the Schwinger pair creation rate, and diagrams such as this, if I cut them in the right way, will give me the contribution to the pair creation rate from diagrams that now have an additional virtual photon exchanged between our electron-positron pair. Okay, so that work was initiated by, by Ritas and Lebedev back in the 70s. Uh, Ritas continued working on, on that in the 80s uh, when Dietrich and Reuter joined the game. Later on, uh, Michael Schmidt and Christian Schubert got involved. Um, and although there's been substantial progress in, in making analytic calculations, really the, the final result is unsatisfactory because it, it turns out that the, the two-loop Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian is just so very complicated that the integrals that one would need to do are essentially intractable at this point. On the other hand, the advantage of this program is that we are much more interested in extracting the imaginary part. We're also interested in the weak field limit, and we want to study uh, this part of our series, which comes from the contribution 
from diagrams involving a large number of photons. And if we make those approximations, we can actually extract a very, very simple result. We already know the imaginary part of the one-loop effective Lagrangian. That's the first term here with our first Schwinger exponent. And the remarkable thing is that the contribution from the two-loop effective Lagrangian takes exactly the same form up to a constant, alpha pi. Here, alpha, of course, is the fine structure constant. Because this is a, a remarkable result. It simply involves a, a slight shift in the constants that we saw at one loop order. Okay, moreover, one plus alpha pi looks very like the first order expansion of exponential of alpha pi. And so there is a very famous exponentiation conjecture which uh, has its roots in Ritas and Lebedev's work that suggests that if we continue adding ever higher order contributions, the only thing that will happen is that our one plus alpha pi will turn into an exponential of alpha pi. So that we would have an all orders result in the weak field limit for a large number of photons, which would look like the one loop result multiplied by exponential of alpha pi. Now, of course, this is um, an extremely uh, severe extrapolation, okay? But there is some physical evidence that supports the possibility of it being true, and that's as follows. I've written the factor beta here explicitly because I want to show that I can absorb this additional term, this alpha pi, into the definition of beta if I'm willing to accept a redefinition of the electron mass. To first order in the field, the shift in the mass would, would look like this. It would be linear in the field, and it's negative. And in fact, this has a very nice physical interpretation. We have our particle-antiparticle pair. We separate them a finite distance. And at the moment that they, they pop into existence as real particles, there is a Coulomb interaction between those particles. And that actually lowers the rest mass threshold that is needed in order for them to become real and it corresponds exactly to first order in the field with this mass shift. So you could interpret this as the shift in the, the, the energy that is needed to create these particles. A second uh, nice correspondence that is noticed is that this shift in the mass corresponds precisely to what is called the Rita's mass shift. Okay, so Rita studied the propagation of an electron. Here it is, the solid line. He studied the propagation of this electron in the presence of a background electric field and found that it can be described as if the electron were propagating with a, an effective mass. And again, to first order in the field, that is exactly the shift in the mass of the electron. So maybe this exponentiation conjecture has some chance of being true. And I'm going to try to give some evidence to support that with some explicit calculations. Okay, so let's have a look. Hmm. Before I do, I should point out, um, Ritas and co. worked on spinner QED, but they were actually beaten to the conjecture. Two years previously, Affleck, Alvarez, and Manton, whom I shall lovingly refer to as AAM, came up with a very analogous conjecture for scalar QED. So they were uh, looking again at a scalar field in a background electromagnetic field. They were using what is known as the world line path integral formulation. Okay, this formulation is something which uh, has its roots in, in, in calculations by Feynman, but Strasler was the guy who really picked that up. Christian Schubert in, in Morelia is uh, an expert in this, and uh, there's a report from 2001 authored by him. I'd like to just uh, take the advantage to advertise that we, we have an updated uh, mini report on uh, advances since 2001. And I also want to take the chance just to say that the world line formalism is something which I consider to be a specialism here in Mexico. So I have come with a group of students from Morelia who are all experts in world line techniques. We have colleagues in Chiapas, in uh, Toluca, in Querétaro, who are also involved in this uh, program. So um, this is something that's very close to my, my heart because it's a very active area of research here in Mexico. But let me get back to, to the point of what I want to say. So AAM, uh, using this technique, were able to show that also the all orders result for the imaginary part of the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian in scalar QED exponentiates in the same way if you look at the weak field limit. 
Okay, now uh, that is, I think, more evidence that this conjecture may turn out to be true in some sense. Okay, diagrammatically, we all love Feynman diagrams, so let's have a look at what this, this means. If I fix the number of loops, the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian corresponds to a sum over the number of external legs attached to the loop. And we're interested in what's happening over here. If I fix the number of photons and I go up through the loops, what I'm doing is simply introducing an ever greater number of internal photons inside these loops. Okay, so going along the uh, rows gives me a Schwinger factor, exponential minus pi over beta. And then going down here, the columns, uh, the conjecture is that this simply exponentiates the one loop result. And this is remarkable for a few reasons. Firstly, we're summing over a, um, a, an infinite number of diagrams. Okay, and we're doing uh, essentially what corresponds to a perturbation series in the number of loops. And normally, such per perturbative series do not produce analytic factors. Okay, the Dyson argument suggests that such series should not be analytic in the coupling constant. Secondly, uh, quite a, a, a subtle point is that we're also counting diagrams that um, are needed in order to achieve the mass renormalization. Turns out they're already taken into account in this table. Um, and thirdly, I feel that it's necessary to point out that we're working here in the quenched approximation. So I'll come back to this point later. There is only ever one fermion loop, right? At, at, at three loop order, there are no diagrams involving two electron loops. But, but that's something which we'll discuss momentarily. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can test this conjecture, okay? I've been talking about the effective Lagrangian. We can pass that information over to uh, n photon amplitudes because we know the effective Lagrangian contains information about these amplitudes. So if the conjecture holds, we ought to see that the ratio of the scattering amplitude for n photons to all loop orders, if we divide that by the one loop result, we should get the same factor. And that's going to be our window for testing the conjecture. So what do we know so far? I don't have time to, to show uh, the results. We do know that the conjecture holds to two loop order in scalar and spinner QED in four dimensions, okay? The question, of course, is can we push that to higher loop order? Can we test the conjecture at three loop order? And so far, the answer has been no. Okay, the three loop Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian is an extremely complicated object, far more so than the two loop uh, or effective Lagrangian. However, in 2005, there was a fantastic, spectacular result, okay? Uh, Krasnansky showed that the scalar Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian, in two dimensions in particular, is actually analytically computable. So he was able to, to analytically determine this scalar uh, effective Lagrangian, and that motivated my colleagues, so Christian, who would have otherwise given this talk, Jerry McKeon, and our uh, colleague Idrish Ouet, who is in Chiapas, to go and look at spinner QED in two dimensions. Okay, so first of all, they had to modify the AAM exponentiation conjecture. The conjecture says that at all loop order, we should be able to take the one loop result and multiply it by this exponentiation factor. It has the same Schwinger exponent, it has a, a modification proportional to uh, the effective fine structure constant with a, an important difference that this parameter kappa actually depends upon the strength of the background field. Okay, so now this is not a constant, but it, it's something that, that depends upon how strong the field is that you apply. But the general structure of this uh, hypothesis remains the same. So they calculated to one and two loop order the effective Lagrangian uh, in two-dimensional spinner QED, and they wrote it analytically in terms of the gamma function and this psi tilde, which is related to the digamma function. Okay, and this is a, a, a essentially a closed analytic result. And it was used in order to extract the scattering amplitude coefficients. So previously, at one loop order, we had access to the one loop coefficients. Now they were able to calculate analytically the two loop coefficients to all orders. 
and they were able to look at the ratio of these coefficients in the limit of a large number of photons. And what came out, the spectacular result that was hoped for, that it would be proportional to this parameter alpha pi squared. The kappa from the previous slide is actually quite subtly absorbed into the definition of these coefficients. So this constant is actually what is needed for the conjecture to hold. Okay, so that's a two-loop order in uh, spinner QED in two dimensions. And of course, the next natural thing to do, before we do, let me just point out the speed of convergence. Okay, so we have, uh, this is the asymptotic result, and we can see that even after maybe 10 photons or 15 photons, already that ratio is very close to the asymptotic prediction. It's a very rapid uh, convergence. Now, very quick aside, we're working in the quench approximation here. And it's important to point out why. Now, in, in vacuum, we have a Fourier's theorem, which is related to charge conjugation symmetry, that tells me that I'd never have to consider diagrams that involve an odd number of photons attached to a loop. Okay, but it turns out that in the case of a constant field, Fourier's theorem no longer applies. However, this diagram in isolation actually still vanishes for the following reasons. Firstly, momentum conservation around this loop implies that we must have a delta function to conserve momentum. Okay, the, the background field can only supply zero uh, momentum photons, so they, we therefore cannot have a flow of momentum in or out of the loop. Then it turns out that the diagram has an expansion in powers of k that starts at linear order, and we would all be very happy looking at something like delta of k times k and saying, well, this is equal to zero. Okay? And for the past 80 years then, Diagrams such as this tadpole have been assumed not to contribute to processes in uh, background field QED. Until 2017, when our colleagues uh, Holger Gies and Felix Karbstein considered the following very simple uh, dumbbell diagram. Now here you've essentially got two tadpoles, so you would think that this could not contribute. But the photon that joins the tadpoles has a 1 over k squared divergence. So if we take the linear part from the first tadpole, the linear part from the second tadpole, we introduce a photon propagator and impose momentum conservation, we're led to the following integral, which actually gives a non-vanishing result. And that has overturned around 80 years of conventional wisdom in this field. Now, the relevance of this talk is that if I want to calculate the full Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian at two-loop order, I should add to the irreducible diagram that I discussed in the previous slide, a contribution from this reducible guy. But analysis shows that this will be a subdominant diagram, and the details are in these papers here. So that's why we can work in the quenched approximation where we ignore multiple fermion loops. Just an advertisement from my, my friend Felix. He has a, a, an amazing paper where he shows that if you look at the strong field limit, actually, it's the reducible diagrams that will contribute. So that's just a little flavor of, of another limit. So let me get back now to the main point. We've done the two-loop Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian in two dimensions. Can we calculate the three-loop guy? Well, there are a number of diagrams that contribute. We've got irreducible diagrams. So these are three-loop, and there are two topologies to consider. Then we have um, a double fermion loop diagram, which we'll ignore because it's not part of the quenched approximation. And we have the tadpoles that I discussed in the previous slide. But we only need to consider here the diagram A and B because they are the only guys that contain the information about the asymptotic structure of our perturbative series. So we will focus only on diagram A and B. Okay, so again, our colleague Idrish and Christian, this time with, uh, with Michelle, were able to uh, figure out a way of calculating semi-analytically the contribution from those um, irreducible diagrams. Okay, so diagram A is quite easy. Diagram B is notoriously difficult. They were able to develop a nice mathematical formulism based upon uh, the dihedral group in order to simplify the Feynman integrals that needed to be carried out. 
And they came to the conclusion that all the coefficients in its expansion will actually be uh, a combination of a rational number plus a rational number times zeta 3. Uh, we know these coefficients analytically, uh, up to second order. Uh, I helped with this calculation. Then we had help from Eric uh, Panzer, who was able to calculate some of these coefficients numerically, and I'll present them on the next slide. We would like the following figure to show convergence to unity. The ratio of coefficients, unfortunately, seems to be monotonically decreasing with number of photons. And that is, in fact, a remarkable result because it seems to suggest that at the three loop level, at least in two dimensions, the exponentiation conjecture does not hold against expectation. Okay? However, this is of course not QED of the real world. We live in a four dimensional space time. So there is still some hope that the exponentiation conjecture holds in four dimensions. And the only way to check that would be to go back and calculate these two diagrams, their contribution to the three loop Euler Heisenberg Lagrangian, but now in four dimensions. And that is an ongoing project which we'll be working on for the next uh, three, four years, maybe longer. An extremely difficult thing to do. And that's actually everything which uh, Christian had hoped to say. Let me just conclude then with a, a summary. So I hope I've convinced you that the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian can be a useful way to study the asymptotic structure of perturbation theory. It requires us to calculate the higher order loop corrections. Um, and we can do that in, in at least in two dimensions, uh, analytically. And we're now turning to try to do the same in four dimensions. We have an exponentiation conjecture, which is an extremely non-trivial conjecture, which uh, we're hoping will hold in uh, four-dimensional space. And it essentially tells us that at a fixed loop order, the asymptotic growth in diagrams is going to be the same. Okay? So it means that we will always be able to relate one order in perturbation theory to an order below or an order above. But more than that, there is a specific way in which these contributions combine precisely such that they exponentiate. We've seen that in d equals 2, it is probably not the case that this happens, although an analytic proof of this is still desired. But I haven't lost hope yet that we might be able to show or prove the conjecture in four dimensions. So the next stop is to calculate the three-loop Euler-Heisenberg dimension, uh, Lagrangian in three dimensions. Quite a big task but I'm hoping that with the, the really um, amazing students that we have uh, working on this project uh, across the country, that we can make some progress towards that end. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. So we have time for one question or comment. You can look at the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian also from the effective field theory point of view. Uh, if you do that, uh, does this give you some insight or is it useless? So in, in a sense, the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian is giving us an effective field theory for photon dynamics. But again, we would need a, a access to that Lagrangian at high order in order to test this conjecture. So I think the answer to the question is yes, but there are obviously barriers to, to doing that in practice in that it requires us to be able to calculate the effective theory to all orders. Um, I think the thing to remember here is that this project is, is using the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian as a tool in order to analyze the perturbative structure of perturbation theory. So of course it would be lovely to calculate the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian analytically, but we're content at this point just specializing to fix regimes of weak field, large photons, just to, to find out whether this, this conjecture can hold to, to all orders. So we have to stop for because we have the next uh, speaker. So we thank James again.
Gracia. Where the technology is from. <laughs> So it is, it is not. What happened? I don't know. It, it's um, oh, the let's see. Oh, ah, okay. Oh. It works. It works. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, so, so I guess we need the ones. No, wait. The, key. the key. The pointer? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's in your phone. Oh, it's in your ones. So now we have our next speaker. So he is a professor at the University of California. <coughs> In Los Angeles, so Svi Bern, so he was, uh, he is a. Uh, the microphone? Ah, oh, you have it here. Okay. So, um, so he was a, uh, he received the prize, Sakurai Prize, for his, uh, uh, com give us uh, the, the possibility to compute calculation from the amplitude level. And so he's going to talk about us about these uh, recent uh, projects and the amplitudes and gravity. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, so Lance spoke about uh, amplitudes and QCD. I will talk about amplitudes and gravity. So uh, the, first, the first point will be about uh, complications with gravity perturbation theory. And then uh, we'll talk about the antidotes to the complexity. And Lance already mentioned the unitarity method. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. And in fact, the unitarity method, it underpins everything that we're going to be talking about. Uh, even when I'm not talking about it, underneath sits the unitarity method that allows us to do the things that we're going to be doing. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about this uh, double copy, the double copy in the color kinematics duality, which is something that helps us do gravity perturbation theory in a very efficient way. And it's something very cool. I think you'll like it if you haven't seen it before. Uh, and then we'll talk about applications of those ideas. Uh, so I'll say just a little bit about something we call the web of theories. It's a way of thinking about different types of theories and how they're related to each other through this double copy and this color kinematics duality. Uh, and uh, as one application, we'll talk about the non-renormalizability properties of supergravity and then a uh, very nice application, this is more recent, is to apply these ideas to uh, uh, thinking about gravitational wave physics. And that would be the type of physics for LIGO. So I mean the real thing, not some abstract gravitational wave problem. And then we'll uh, give the outlook. Hmm. So what are the complications? Well, that's kind of simple. It's, it's basically that gravity is a mess. That's the complication. And it, it doesn't take long to find the mess. Uh, you, you, can, you can find the mess uh, probably in about a half hour or so. Uh, what you do is you, t you take the uh, Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, uh, you take the metric, you expand it around, it could be flat space, it could be around some background, and then you just plug it in there and then you work out the series expansion in terms of uh, the gravitational field. And what you find in terms of Feynman diagrams, uh, uh, which represent the terms of the Lagrangian, there'd be an infinite set of interactions, three-point interactions, four-point, and these get ever more complicated, and in fact, they get horrendously complicated. We'll have a look at what the three-point looks like in just a minute. And if you compare that to QCD, uh, while QCD is a complicated theory, as, as uh, we heard in, in uh, Lance's talk, it takes some non-trivial ideas to tame it, it's definitely a much simpler theory as compared to gravity. Uh, just from a very simple point of view that these vertices are very simple, 
uh, 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 relatively speaking, compared to the gravitational ones. There's, for example, there's just a three-point interaction, a four-point interaction. Uh, and uh, the other thing that you can see is that it looks like these theories are quite different. That they, they don't have much to do with each other uh, other than a superficial connection of some kind, that uh, they have some kind of a uh, gauge invariance. But the details of the theories look quite different. So let's do a little comparison on what these details look like. Uh, so if we look at the uh, three-point interaction, so that'd be, uh, say, three gluons interacting or three gravitons interacting. When we do a, a little comparison, we can see that they're uh, quite different. Uh, well, first here, there's a, this thing we call a color factor. And, and that's just the fact that a non-abelian gauge theory has different types of charges, and you need a matrix to keep track of that. So that's this color factor here. And uh, this is based on a Lie algebra. And then there's some kinematic uh, uh, factor, and this is the well-known Yang-Mills interaction. <clears throat> and if we compare that to the gravitational one, you can see this one's quite a bit more complicated. In fact, it, it's much more complicated than what, uh, what it looks like is here, because there's something hiding in the notation. There's a P6. This represents six terms. There's six different types of terms that you have to permute labels. Uh, 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 to write down all the different possibilities. Yeah, there's three terms, there's a sim here. The sim is a little bit evil because you have to symmetrize on the indices of the graviton on each, on each pair here because the graviton is a symmetric tensor. So you get about 100 terms. And, and uh, pretty, pretty quickly you decide that gravity is a mess. And if you're a, a clever graduate student and your advisor said, I'll go do some calculation using this vertex, uh, you should probably say, oh, that's very nice, but I'm working on something different. Uh, and you can do some very amusing counting. If you just do just some simple arithmetic where you count the number of terms in each vertex, and then you count the number of terms in the propagators, and you just multiply it out, expand it out, the way you would do in a Feynman diagram calculation, you get completely ridiculous numbers. Uh, three loops, you'd be encountering Feynman diagrams with 10 to the 20th terms. Uh, obviously, you can't do such calculations uh, with any computer. And then as you go march down, I'll, I'll be talking at some point about some five-loop calculation. And you can do a little arithmetic there. You'll get some giant number, 10 to the 31 terms, which happens to be more terms than there are atoms in your brain. And that's a proof you can't do the calculation because it doesn't fit in your head or, or a computer or a disk drive. Um, but, but in fact, um, uh, there, we now do these types of calculations routinely, these high loop orders, we do it routinely. I didn't say easily, I said routinely. Right? Uh, so, but, because you, you have to tame something that's extremely complicated. And also, let's face it, if you're doing high loop calculations, uh, it, you know, even in a relatively simple theory like QCD, it's still pretty complicated. Okay, but, uh, but the question is, the idea is to make it doable, that if we have some uh, theoretical question we'd like to answer, then uh, we can answer it. Okay, so how do we tame it? Well, Lance already explained about uh, unitarity method. Uh, and the basic idea is to think about uh, uh, things from an on-shell viewpoint, where you try to build more complicated objects from... Uh, simpler objects, but, but the simpler objects are in terms of uh, on-shell quantities. That's where Einstein's relation between energy and momentum is satisfied. You do this at tree level. Uh, and so Lance mentioned factorization. You do it at loop level in terms of these cuts. We call them the unitarity cuts. There's generalized unitarity cuts. There's uh, the idea that you put... Uh, intermediate states on shell and some much more complicated structure and that way you can reconstruct the entire amplitude. Now I'm not going to explain exactly how this works or what the rules are but let me just say there's a systematic set of rules for doing this and this underlies everything we do. Uh, this basic idea that we should be thinking about 
on shell quantities and how to, how to construct more complicated amplitudes from simpler amplitudes through an on-shell reconstruction. Okay. And in fact, these little pictures you see here, later on they're going to appear in the gravitational wave problem. Now, I showed you before this extremely complicated gravitational interaction, the three-point interaction. Uh, and the reason why it was so complicated is because we were looking at it the wrong way. We were looking at it in terms of gauge non-invariant quantities, unphysical quantities. The states on the external legs were not restricted to be on shell. They were not physical. So in general relativity, there's a big problem that eight out of 10 con components of the graviton of the, of the, of the uh, individual states, they're garbage. And that garbage causes a, pen a penalty, a very heavy penalty, that you get a very complicated vertex. We should look at it in the on-shell point of view. So let's put these legs on shell, and you discover a miracle. It's in, a, in some sense the key to everything, the tip of an iceberg. What you discover is that the gravitational interaction looks like it's a product of Yang-Mills vertices of this kinematic part. So you replace this color factor with another kinematic part. Now, you'd say, okay, oh, he was pretty cute, but uh, what of it? Because uh, this is only the three-point vertex. Um, and in fact, we're interested, we, need, we would need a method of building the entire S matrix from here. But in fact, we have such a method. Um, well, the first observation that in fact, there is a very simple relationship between gravity and gauge theory. That's from string theory, the Kawhi Luo and Tai relations. This is from 1985. Um, it took a while before people appreciated the significance of, of this. Um, and what these relations say is basically what we found on the previous page is something very general, at least at tree level. It allows, it gives us a, a simple relationship between a four graviton interaction, two gravitons come in, two go out, and we rewrite it in terms of two gluons coming in, two gluons going out, times another copy of it. And that's what this formula says. Uh, to, if you know what a color ordered amplitude is, well, th these objects are color ordered amplitudes, they're not amplitudes. I mean, that's some manipulation that you do to uh, strip away the color factors. Uh, but, in any case, this is, this is something you derive from gauge theory, and it's directly a piece of, of the uh, gauge theory tree-level amplitude. And in fact, there's formulas for any number of legs. Kawhi Long and Tai, I think, they did it to six points. Uh, and at some point later, we generalized, wrote down the explicit formula for any number of legs. And what you learn from this is something very profound. Uh, the first point is that gravity is derivable from gauge theory. That you do not need to look at the gravitational Lagrangian. The information, everything, can be found in gauge theory. And standard Lagrangians, they offer no hint why this is true. So uh, this Kuala Lumpur, 1985, well, it's uh, quite, quite a number of years later, it's uh, 35 years later, and you can go back to the Lagrangian and we still don't understand where these formulas come from in a simple way. I mean, sure, you can crank out Feynman rules and you can prove laboriously these formulas, but there's no intuitive way that you can connect the Lagrangian to these formulas. At least no one knows how to do that. And the other point is generally applicable. So this was derived in string theory, but when you analyze how it works in the field theory limit, then, in fact, you, you recognize that this, this is a very general formula. And uh, there's more to it. It turns out that if you want to understand the secret of gravity, the place to look is not in gravity, but in gauge theory. We should be looking at the structure of gauge theory, and this would be the first simple example of that. Uh, so uh, here's the three gluon vertex. And these color factors, they obey a Lie algebra. That's what they do for a living. Uh, Lie algebras obey the Jacobi identity. 
So that means there's a relationship between color factors of these three types of diagrams, S, T, and U. Now, if, if you use Feynman rules, if you construct the amplitude, there'd be a fourth diagram. But let's use this very fancy identity. Uh, one is equal to S over S, where one over S would be a Feynman propagator. So if the Feynman propagator is missing, you put it back, and you just sort the pieces in here according to the color factors of these three diagrams. So you write it, you write the amplitude in this format. There's a kinematic numerator, comes from here and from a four-point interaction. There's a color factor, that's uh, just from sewing up these color factors here. And there's a Feynman propagator. And you can go home and check this. It's, it, it works um, no matter how you do it, as long as you put these particles on shell. That's very important. These have to be, this thing has to be, in some sense, a physical quantity. And you will find that the numerators satisfy the same Jacobi identity as the color factors. Now, you'll say, oh, that's very cute. Uh, what of it? No, OK, that's true. This is not uh, so impressive. Uh, but first point is, it's true in general. It's true for an arbitrary number of legs that we have proven. This is a tree level. So let's say at five point, you'd write the amplitude in terms of 15 diagrams. And the claim is that there is a way of organizing the amplitude such that for every color Jacobi identity, there's a kinematic identity, one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, if you try this at home with Feynman diagrams, it will not work. There's a special arrangement. You have to find an arrangement where this is true. Uh, but let's say you can use Feynman diagrams to compute what the correct amplitude is. And then you can, uh, by brute force, you could find an arrangement where this is true, let's say at five points. And in fact, there's general ways of, of now of generating these things for arbitrary numbers of legs. And there's a proof of this. Um, and, and, um, now, you still might say, so what? And say, this is very cute. This is very entertaining. But what does this have to do with gravity? Well, it has everything to do with gravity. And the reason is because once you make this arrangement, you've got a magical power. So what we'll do is we'll take an endpoint tree amplitude, and we'll rewrite it in this format in terms of um, uh, uh, where the uh, kinematic numerators of the diagrams, so each term represents a diagram, the kinematic numerators of the diagram satisfy exactly the same Jacobi identity as the color factor. And after that, it's actually quite easy to prove that, in fact, you get the correct gravity amplitude just by taking the color factor, replacing it by the numerator factor. Now, in, in some way, this is magic because I have to say we do not understand this fully because this implies there's an, some kind of a kinematic Lie algebra behind these numerators. That uh, Lie algebra is only partially understood in certain cases, special cases, self-dual field configurations, but, but a general, there's no general understanding of that. Um, and and it, this really has some remarkable implications because it states that gravity is not kind of like, like uh, a gauge theory. It's really the same physical quantity in the sense that the same dynamics, it's, it's governed, it's, the dynamics of the gravity theory is governed by the same objects, these kinematic numerators, as you find in the, uh, in the gauge theory. They really belong together. It definitely cries out for some kind of a unified description of gravity with gauge theory, presumably along the lines of string theory. Of course, this doesn't prove string theory, but, uh, but clearly these two theories belong together. In detail, the dynamics of the theory, at least as far as these scattering amplitudes are concerned, they're controlled by exactly the same quantities. It's kind of a miracle. And as I emphasize, this is very hard to see from the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian. There's just no way. And, and this is something very general. It works for all sorts of theories. I mean, I'll pick a few easy ones. N equals eight supergravity, if you want that theory. Uh, the maximally supersymmetric gravity, what you do is you um, 
Right? To build that out of two n equals four super Yang Mills theories, you can build n equals five supergravity, from n equals four super Yang Mills, n equals one super Yang Mills, and, and so on and so forth. And in fact, now there's a whole zoology of these things. There's so many I can hardly keep track of what's related to what. Uh, so we constructed, there's a little chart we constructed uh, called Web of Theories. So this is in our recent review article. Section five discusses the web of theory. So I'm not gonna say too much about it, but um, what these lines represent between these theories, so let's say there's gauge supergravity, there's uh, uh, like an n equals two, Maxwell-Einstein supergravity, you know, there, and uh, there's string theories up here, uh, Einstein gravity over here, and, and, and these lines represent that these theories share an underlying theory, like a factor theory. So these, are, these theories are products of simpler theories, like gravity is two copies of gauge theory. Oops, gauge theory. Uh, and what the line represents is that uh, this product theory shares one product. Okay. And if you want to go read about it, I mean, you should go look at that. Uh, and the key message from this slide is it's not, it's not just a few theories, it's not just gravity, but it's something much more general that you find in, in uh, theoretical physics of relations between theories and this double copy way of viewing things. Yeah. Now, I've been talking about uh, this uh, du double copy relation, this color kinematics duality for scattering amplitudes. And an obvious question is, is it possible that the same ideas hold for general classical solutions? You just pick a solution of general relativity and then you can interpret it in terms of a double copy. Well, we don't know the answer to that in general, but we have plenty of examples. In fact, Andres Luna, he will explain some examples uh, and there's many examples uh, like, uh, starting to be a zoology of these. Uh, so there's the black holes, uh, cases with cosmological constant, radiation cases, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, let me just emphasize, we have plenty of examples, but there's no general understanding. And what we need is some young smart person to look at the pattern and try to understand uh, how to think about this in a way that's actually very general. So let, let me turn now to uh, the first major application of these ideas. So you say, okay, look, there's this nice relationship between gravity and gauge theory, and the key question is, what are you gonna do with it? Okay, so let's talk about one problem. There's uh, the non-renormalizability problem in gravity. So everybody says that gravity is a non-renormalizable theory, that, um, it's not like gauge theory. And the arguments are actually pretty straightforward. It's just dimensional analysis. What you do is you notice that Newton's constant is dimensionful. And because Newton's constant is dimensionful, uh, if you were to compare a gravity Feynman diagram to a gauge theory Feynman diagram, you realize that uh, if the gauge theory has, let's say, one power, of momentum here, let's say in one, one spot, the gravity one needs two powers of momentum in the vertex. And therefore, when you do the loop integral, this is going to have a poor behavior compared to that one because there's just more powers of momentum up there. And that's the basic argument. Now you can get very sophisticated and write very complicated papers looking at supersymmetry and superspace and so on and so forth. But this is the essential reason why people say that uh, Gravity theories must be non-renormalizable. All point-like theories of gravity must be non-renormalizable. And if you look at Green, Schwartz, and Witten, the various arguments, and that's why we have to do string theory. Well, it might actually be good to know if it's true. Because in a sense, this is not a question of argument. It's a question of calculation. We know the theories of gravity. We know supergravity, we know how to construct them, and the question is, how do they actually behave? And what you have to worry about 
There's a very obvious loophole. These arguments are based on power counting, assuming there's no hidden symmetry or some hidden structure. And what do I mean by hidden symmetry? I don't mean hidden from the theory. The theory knows very well what its symmetries are. I mean hidden from us humans, that we haven't thought about it correctly. Because if you've ever looked at the N equals eight supergravity Lagrangian, you might decide it's actually pretty complicated. Maybe something is hidden. Um, <clears throat> so it seems like this idea uh, uh, you know, uh, that we can relate this to a simpler theory means we can actually check some of the assertions people have made. And the theory, uh, the best theory to be looking at is N equals eight supergravity. Uh, the reason why it's a good theory is because supersymmetry helps with ultraviolet problems. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's a well-known feature of supersymmetric theories. Uh, so you, you want to study the theory with the most supersymmetry, that's the most likely one that might actually be finite, ultraviolet finite, uh, might, might uh, make it so that these arguments fail. And the other reason is high symmetry means you can go much further in your calculation. So that's a good theory to look at. Well, I can start the little scorecard. I mean, there have been a lot of predictions over the years. Uh, over the years, the predictions shift um, people say all sorts of things. So I'm going to make fun of some people, but let me point out that uh, me and Lance, we're, we're up there also. So uh, back in, back in uh, 1998, we wrote a paper where we, we were pretty certain. We, had a, we thought we had a pretty good argument that, in fact, N equals 8 supergravity would diverge at five loops. Uh, and, and over the years, there have been different arguments uh, and, and it keeps on shifting. And some of the shift has to do when a calculation gets done, then people stop arguing about that because we now know the answer, and they start arguing about the next level. Uh, so let's have a look at the scorecard. It's actually not so impressive. Uh, you know, pretty much everybody who opens their mouth on this, trying to make a prediction on what, how supergravity actually behaves, where the first ultraviolet divergence is, it's generally wrong. Uh, there's one counterexample. Th this counterexample is a little tricky. It has some weird structure. There's some anomaly-like behavior, so it's a little hard to interpret whether this was actually correct or not. Because it's, it's kind of correct, strictly speaking, but on the other hand, if you look at the details, it's a lot more subtle than, uh, than any prediction or, or any the predictions took into account. Um, and the one that we're most interested in, it's this one. Uh, because th this is the place where you run out of uh, supersymmetry arguments. Uh, there's just, no, there's just no, no more supersymmetry. You've used up every drop of supersymmetry to get to this high loop order. Uh, now, unfortunately, we, we still don't know the answer. I love very much to, to answer what this is. Um, now, what's the current wisdom? What, what do people say currently? Um, well, the, the uh, symmetry arguments, as far as they've gone, they make various predictions. And in a sense, these predictions, they're, they're actually easy to understand if you're, if you're amused. I can explain it afterwards. But essentially, it comes from assuming that there's nothing complicated about the, uh, the maximal supersymmetry or, or the, these extended supersymmetries, n equals four, n equals five, and you just count up the anti-commuting parameters and you do some simple power counting, and that's where you get this from. Uh, actually, the actual analysis is much more complicated than that because uh, no such superspace exists, like the, the one I described where you just count up the, uh, the anti-commuting parameters. Uh, it's, it's much more subtle. Uh, but in any case, the, the the current state of the art in terms of making predictions is uh, n equals four supergravity should diverge at three loops in, in uh, four dimensions, n equals five at four loops in four dimensions, uh, half maximal uh, at two loops in d equals five. Uh, there, here's a weird one. n equals eight supergravity should diverge at five loops in d equals 24 fifths. I mean, what the hell do we mean by d equals 24 fifths? Well, we're theorists, we can do what we like. Uh, of course, I mean, we could do what we like, but there's a question, are we doing something sensible? That, that, that's uh, maybe another question. The reason why uh, 
why this was done is because the real question we're interested in is not D equals 24 fifths. I mean, let's face it, who cares about that? We're interested in D equals four, right? In the real world, in the physical dimension, is there a divergence at seven loops? It happens to be that there's a D8, R to the fourth counter term, at seven loops in D equals four, which matches D equals 24 fifths at five loops. So that five, five loops is fewer loops than seven. So that's why we're interested in that. So it's, it's just a, a, a stand-in for doing the real, the real problem. Let's look at the scorecard. So we've actually calculated a lot of this. Well, people have run out of symmetry arguments, but we haven't run out of calculation. And the answer is uh, ba basically every prediction is wrong except for this one. This one we don't know. This is the, the key one we're interested in. This one is a little disappointing. N equals eight supergravity should diverge in five loops, and it actually does. That means that symmetry arguments are correct, that, that nothing has been missed. There's no hidden symmetry in D equals 24 fifths. But the little problem is how do you interpret this? Let's look at N equals five supergravity at four loops uh, in D equals four. This one has an extra cancellation beyond the symmetry arguments. How can it be that a theory with less symmetry has more cancellation, extra cancellation, compared to the one uh, with more supersymmetry. It doesn't make sense. Could it be just, well, we shouldn't have worked in D equals 24 fifths, and you, know, you get punished for working in unphysical dimensions? Could that be the problem? Well, there's a paper, a recent paper, which in fact emphasizes that. They don't have a proof, but they look at uh, certain pieces, unitarity cuts, and they prove, indeed, there are extra cancellations and D equals four. So, in fact, we want to go to seven loops. Personally, I'm taking a little break from that. Uh, although Alex Edison, uh, he, he's strong. He's, he's continuing. Um, and, uh, by the way, uh, seven loops, if you know anything about how QCD works, you say that's impossible. But, you know, as we do these calculations, we learn a lot about the structure. So when we began the five loop calculation, seven looked impossible to us. But now that we've done the five, we've learned enough that it actually looks possible. It doesn't mean it's easy. Actually, let me, let me I'm gonna run out of time, so let me just uh, skip this. But there, there's something, I mean, the, the point is there's something mysterious going on. The bottom line, is N equals five supergravity proves without any doubt that there are cancellations beyond the standard symmetry arguments. So there is something going on in these theories, extra cancellations as we were originally worried about. Okay, and we don't know the answer. Now, there is some, uh, some very positive result from this. Um, we could do the D equals 24 fifths and I say, okay, we got a result we didn't like because there's no extra cancellation. But there is something very positive, which is the very fact we could do this. We can do five loop calculations in supergravity using these ideas I just told you about. Now, I have to admit, it's a little bit more complicated than I made it out to be. There's, there's some issues of exactly how you use this double copy at such a high loop order. Uh, nevertheless, we did it. And so the key message is calculations which are just impossible. I mean, remember that 10 to the 31? And, and if you try doing this, this type of thing, let's say some kind of ordinary superspace way of doing it, you take out the Feynman rules of superspace, you're going to face that 10 to the 31. You're not, you can't even touch this. Here, we can do calculations that look impossible, and we do them routinely, even if they're hard, and even if there's various issues you have to face up to. So, this makes us a little arrogant, so we think, ah, gravity problems, we're really good at it. Right, gravity perturbation theory. So, what's the most interesting gravity perturbation theory you could think of today? There it is, applications to gravitational wave physics. So is it possible to apply these ideas I've been talking about to a completely different problem, a problem of classical physics? 
Well, there's a new era. The era of gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, by the way, I, I started thinking about this uh, uh, pretty early. It's a little fact that uh, for an instant, this, first, this is the first event, it was brighter in gravitational radiation than all the stars in the visible universe are in electromagnetic radiation. And that's really awesome. I mean, that, that's a, a lot of power coming out of this thing. Okay, so the, but the question is, okay, we're particle theorists. We don't do general relativity. How can we help? So you can look at um, the typical problem we're interested in. So Lance spoke a lot about this. Uh, there's a collision, and then out comes uh, particles uh, in an unbounded trajectory. The types of things we think about are gauge theories, QCD, electroweak. We think about quantum field theory. We're doing this in the quantum realm. On the other hand, the problem of gravitational radiation as seen by LIGO uh, is uh, a different problem. That's a bounded orbit. That's general relativity. It's classical physics. There's black holes there. And you say, what the heck do these two things have to do with each other? Uh, it, it turns out a lot, and it's just based on some simple insight that uh, the black holes and neutron stars, we can think of them as point particles as far as long wavelength radiation is concerned. And once we can think of these things as point particles, that's our territory. And in fact, this was known long ago. Iwasaki understood this back in 1971, that you can think about of this problem from the point of view of a perturbation theory of Feynman diagrams. You think of Feynman diagrams. Goldberg and Rothstein systematized this, this way of thinking about it, and many people have been thinking about it. But uh, what I want to uh, tell you about is that, in fact, these ideas that I've been telling you about, they're, in fact, ideally suited for pushing state of the art in this type of problem. Okay. Now, there, there's, we ha, you know, I have to explain a few things. Uh, there's some issues here. The, the, this, is, this is a quantum problem. This is a classical problem. So how to think about how to go between classical and quantum, how to go between unbounded and bounded. Those are, in a sense, the key issues that we have to face up to if we're going to use any of the technology and any of the ways of thinking about things. So, so first, uh, let me explain what what we want to uh, uh, try to solve or help with. Um, so the, the problem um, is two black holes is an in-spiral, and they decay because they emit gravitational radiation, and then at some point there's a merger, and then the ring down. So the ring down, that's done by a perturbation theory of, of quasi-normal modes, just the vibration. Never mind that, that's under good control. The merger, well, that's not for us. That's done by numerical relativity. You can't do that by perturbation theory because uh, at, at this point, everything is strongly interacting. The part that we want to look at is the in-spiral phase, and this is done analytically. So the professionals do not do this numerically. They do it analytically. They use numerical relativity to help guide models, to, to build very accurate models. But this is done analytically using perturbation theories, the basic building block. It's called uh, post-Newtonian theory. Okay, and this is up our alley. Because now we can think of these as two-point particles, and then there's uh, a perturbation theory to try to understand the corrections that come from general relativity. So what's this post-Newtonian approximation? So this is the, say, the standard way of thinking about this problem. Uh, so what you do is you expand in Newton's constant and v squared, and that's very reasonable because uh, by the virial theorem, v squared is like gm over r, so there's a balance between kinetic energy and, and potential energy, and they're the same order of magnitude, so do a simultaneous expansion. And, uh, and Einstein understood this. Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman, they worked out the first post-Newtonian correction to the Hamiltonian. Uh, <clears throat> so this first term here, this thing you can recognize, that's Newton. And then here's 
first correction. And then over the years, people have been systematically grinding these out. Uh, this was done in 2017, this is 2019, to get the fourth post-Newtonian order. And the reason people do this is because it's important. This, these terms can be measured by LIGO. And more importantly, they're used for constraining these, what they're called uh, models, like effective one body model, constraining the models that are used for the actual waveform construction. Uh, you, need, you need to go, you have to have some information beyond perturbation theory if you want to get very close to the merger, I, I, which in fact you can see uh, the blue is where you're using uh, an improved perturbation theory, but the input is still perturbation theory. And of course, the people in scattering amplitudes, you know, we realized that something could be done. So there's a, a bit of an industry that's developed, a small industry on, on these questions. Uh, the one basic question which a lot of people have worked on is the connection to scattering amplitudes. Uh, how is this problem connected to scattering amplitudes? What's a good formalism going from the problem of scattering amplitudes to the problem of, of uh, let's say, a two-body potential, trying to work out the Hamiltonian of, of, the, um, of the two inspiraling black holes? Uh, there's world line approaches people have taken, uh, looking at double copy. There's Various technical issues having to do with how the double copy works and it gives too many states and you have to get rid of some of the states. How do you do that? But really there's, a, there's a, a fundamental question, more important than any other question. Can we do something beyond the state of the art of the general relativity people? Because if you can't, it's just fun and games and you're, you're just chasing them, you can't. You know, you, you, you want to make a difference. You want to do something beyond the ability of our general relativity friends. So when we started thinking about this problem, uh, we had, in a sense, uh, some boundary conditions of what we wanted to do. So there's various things you can look at. Uh, you can look at spin effects, and a lot of people work on spin effects. This is very popular. Finite size effects, that's, in there, that's important for neutron stars. Uh, new physics effects, radiation, high orders of perturbation theory. So the question is, which problem should we look at? And remember, we want to make a difference. So first thing, absolutely, it had to be extremely difficult by standard methods. If it's not extremely difficult by standard methods, then what do they need us for? It needs to be of <coughs> direct importance to LIGO theorists. It needed to be relevant to the core mission of LIGO, and it needed to be in a form, at least in principle, to enter the LIGO analysis pipeline. If you give them some object that they can't use, that's not so helpful. So what's the answer to that? Well, there was a unique choice. Uh, of course, we spoke to our friends in the general relativity community to figure out what's really the best thing. High orders and perturbation theory. And the precise name is the two-body two Hamiltonian at the third post minkowskian order. Okay, what is that? Well, that was laid out very nicely by Alessandra Bunano. She came to Amplitudes 2018, and she told us what to do. What's the important thing to do? So th this is a bit of a crowded uh, slide, but I, I like it because it comes from authority. Uh, and, and this lays out the different types of perturbation theory. Uh, so we can do a perturbation theory post-Newtonian, and that's by following these columns here. So you're expanding in velocity, and one of our actually means g, and you're expanding in Newton's constant. And this would be Newton, this would be Einstein, uh, Infeld, and Hoffman, and so on and so forth, um, just marching down here. But there's another perturbation theory that is much, much more natural from the point of view of particle physics, and that's you just do what we call perturbation theory, you expand in Newton's constant, in the coupling constant, uh, and you do not expand in velocity. From our point of view, it's a silly thing to do because uh, it, we want to do things in a relativi relativistically invariant way, Lorentz invariant, so you want to keep all orders in velocity. Uh, and in fact, this has become much more popular, in, even independent of us, the general relativity community realized that He reads my mind. Uh, 
uh, the general relativity community uh, realize that this is a, a, a much better way of organizing the perturbation theory in terms of understanding its analytic structure. And then Alessandra, she said, look, this hasn't been done. This is what you need to go do. So let me clear, be clear about what we're after. So <clears throat> what we want to do is replace general relativity with something a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's a two-body interaction, a potential, very much like Newton's potential, but extra terms, uh, such that we extract all the physics juice from uh, general relativity, leaving behind uh, the, the complexity, but we have the physics. Uh, and the part we're after is the conservative part, the Hamilton, the, it's the Hamiltonian. And the radiation part, that gets treated separately. If you're interested in how that's done, I can explain that afterwards. Uh, and uh, we want to do it in a way that's compatible with special relativity. It needs to be valid to all orders, uh, sorry, uh, ordered to valid to order G cubed, the next order. How do we do it? Well, this is laid out very nicely in a paper by Chung, Rothstein, and Salon. We take ideas from effective field theory. We put it together with ideas from scattering amplitudes, and that gives us these post minkowski potentials. Now, when, we start, when I started looking at this pro problem, uh, it's actually kind of amusing uh, because um, you realize, uh, or at least I realized very quickly, that what I learned in graduate school wasn't quite right. Uh, so uh, at tree level, it's pretty simple. If you want a potential from an amplitude, you just take a Fourier transform, and pretty much that's all there is to it. But if you go beyond one loop, things, uh, things become very unobvious very quickly. Uh, the first a little surprise is, uh, at least what I learned in graduate school, is every loop is an h-bar. Uh, that means loops are, are quantum and should be ignored. They have nothing to do with classical physics. That, that's completely wrong. Uh, while it's true if you scale h-bars in a certain way that it, it's a true statement, uh, the, the pertinent question is, how do you extract classical physics from here? And, and if you do the scaling correctly, in fact, the loops scale like one over h bar. It's backwards. Uh, and now you say, where did that come from? That, that's not so complicated. If you take e to the i s classical over h bar and you series expand, you get one over h bars. And that's related to iteration, double counting, that in here, what you get the, the uh, tree amplitude comes three times. And there's an iteration, and you have to take that out because you're not interested in the pieces you've re you already understand, like the tree pieces. Um, but you can get confused very quickly because you start worrying about cross terms between 1 over h bar and h bar and what's quantum, what's classical. And the right way to deal with this problem, at least the cleanest way of dealing with this problem, is to use effective field theory. And the effective field theory, what it does for you for a living, is it defines the potential. We're interested in classical potential, but we have scattering amplitudes. How the heck are you supposed to extract a, cl a p classical potential from some quantum scattering amplitude? This is the solution. You write down an effective field theory for black holes that are interacting. I can call them scalars, or I can call them black holes. So, uh, so A and B are two different black holes. So, um, and this would be the kinetic term. It's relativistic. You'll say, but wait a second, this doesn't look like what you're used to, the quadratic one. But remember, the quadratic one has antiparticles. We want classical field theory, classical physics, so no antiparticles. So that's the kinetic term. The, the uh, interaction is just the interaction potential. So this is the potential. So at the lowest order, Newton sits here. At the next order, there would be Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman would be inside of here. And this just represents two black holes interacting. A is, is one black hole. There's another one. There's the potential. Okay? And the way we extract the potential is by matching to the full theory. We, we demand this theory give the same scattering amplitude. So we do two simultaneous calculations uh, in parallel. Full theory, we take out the heavy machinery. We have amplitude methods, double copy, unitarity method. We do this all in the context of h bar goes to zero, and, and there's some loop integration you have to do. You get an amplitude. Then the effective field theory, that's a much simpler theory. We just use Feynman diagrams. And you just 
uh, make an ansatz for what the potential is. You feed that ansatz to the end. You demand these two be equal. That determines what the coefficients in the ansatz is. And now you have your potential. And, and then you're done because you can now hand that potential or hand the Hamiltonian associated with that potential. You can hand it to your uh, LIGO theory friends and they're absolutely delighted. I mean, just to show you, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Okay, yeah, I'm definitely running out of time. So uh, a little bit of what goes into this. We have, uh, we use unitarity and double copy. So the first interesting thing that happens is we're interested in the long range forces. So uh, we're interested where the gravitons are long range and that effectively what it does is it puts the gravitons on shell. So there's one black hole, another black hole interacting through gravitons. These are on shell. So we're, we're in unitarity heaven because the problem itself puts things on shell. And then it turns out that if you want the classical limit, in fact, one more matter line has to go on shell. And, and, and that's related to the fact that the energy integral should be localized because in classical physics, uh, you, you know, Einstein's relation between energy and momentum has to be satisfied. So in fact, one more line goes on shell, so now you're really in heaven. So to build up the, the, the scattering amplitude, you just have to do uh, uh, these unitarity cuts. Take a three-point tree, three-point tree, four-point tree, multiply, sum over the states, and you have it. And to the next order, this is the one we were after, the new one, then it's just a handful of these three unitarity cuts. The worst thing is a five-point amplitude. We're in heaven. So just to show you uh, one example here is, uh, let's say, one loop. Then um, the way you do this is you take a three-point tree, three-point tree, of gravity, four-point tree, multiply them, sum over states, use the KLT relations. That would be one way to do it. BCJ is used for, uh, for uh, other reasons, for technical reasons having to do with infrared singularities. That's a better way of doing it or a more rigorous way, but, but this is a clean way of doing it, maybe less rigorous. Um, but, but in any case, uh, you use the KLT relations and, and life is good. And to show you how simple this is, these are the four-point amplitudes in helicity states, and they are really simple. And, and uh, you can do a little spinnerology, work out the cuts, you get... Uh, you know, some simple expression in terms of kinematic invariance. You see there's these pieces like something squared. So if you want to do now do the gravity case, you take two copies, like two pieces of paper and merge them, and you get now the gravity answer. You see there's the fourth power. Previous one was two powers, so well, that's double copy at work. Uh, and then uh, it's straightforward then to extract you know, do the matching, get the potential, get scattering angles, do classical physics. This one is more complicated, of course. Um, a two-loop problem. Um, but the ideas are the same. It's, it's just like a one-loop, except you just have to do uh, more, more algebra. There's some uh, non-trivial trickery of exactly how to do these integrals. These are two-loop integrals, so you, ha you have to do them right, and you have to do them in a way that makes use of the fact that you're only interested in the classical part to do them efficiently. And long story short, there's the answer. It might look complicated to you, but I'll show you in a second. This is actually incredibly simple, this answer. Uh, and it's in terms of ki uh, various kinematic invariants. Um, and you go through the matching the effective field theory, extract the potential. Here's the potential. Newton is hiding right in here. Uh, this looks more complicated than Newton because remember Newton is static. This now has velocity terms. So this is like Newton plus velocity terms. The first term here, that's a Newton-like thing. And here's all the velocity corrections to Newton. Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman is a combination of these two pieces, some of this and some of that. Uh, and the key thing, this is all orders in velocity. Now you might say, okay, this is very nice. How do you know it's right? Well, the answer, of course, is we have to compare to the literature. There's a vast literature in the post-Newtonian approximation done all the way to fourth post-Newtonian order. So we can series expand in velocity and turn it 
turn our expression into a post-Newtonian type expression where you series expand in velocity. And then what you do is you just have to grind out a canonical transformation to match their result. Because their Hamiltonian will not match ours because two Hamiltonians will never match if done by two different people because in general there will be some canonical transformation between them. And uh, actually one new test that just uh, came out, Bini and Damour, they verified that in fact to the next order beyond where we looked that in fact we also have it correct. And uh, just to amuse you, this is what the fourth post-Newtonian post Hamiltonian looks like. Looks like a mess. Uh, why is it a mess? Well, one reason is they series expand a simple function, so they turn it into a mess. Uh, so, you know, don't series expand it. And the other reason is they have a poor gauge choice as far as getting a clean answer. Uh, it's actually uh, ADM Hamiltonian, if you if you care what it is, but that is not a good choice if you're interested in clean answers. Uh, and then, okay, our, our, our LIGO theory, theory friends, are they interested in it? Absolutely. It only took them eight days to write a paper. <laughs> uh, to, to, to try to understand that as a first pass, does this actually help with LIGO? Now, uh, there, there's no conclusion on that point from this paper, and I have no idea how it'll turn out once it's done more carefully, but at least this is a demonstration that our friends are definitely interested in, the, in, in this, uh, are excited about this, I should say. Anyway, they say, encouraging more study. Sounds good to me. Most exciting part of this is that the methods are far from exhausted. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, and we're starting to work on the next order, and in fact, the path looks clean. Uh, the main thing we have to do is, I have to do is clear my desk of other things so we can work on this, but uh, the, the, the methods uh, were cert most certainly not exhausted. Uh, but probably something even more interesting is, uh, in the first pass that we set up this problem, we were thinking about it from a certain viewpoint of how to do it, and that had to do with matching available technology, uh, which is not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. So, I am quite sure there will be much, much better ways of doing it in the coming years. That when we look back five years from now at how we did it, you know, we're all going to laugh, look at these clumsy guys, how they did it. There's definitely better ways of doing it. And there's uh, clearly uh, other things to be looking at besides just the conservative Hamiltonian that we were looking at. Uh, uh, there's, uh, well, straightforward things would be higher orders, of course, so that looking at the Hamiltonian. Uh, Resummation, that's the key. Why are we doing perturbation theory like this? I, part of it is because we think, well, if we do one more order, it'll feed into some improvement eventually into LIGO or future experiments. But, but we're really, in a sense, after the big, the big things, trying to understand not just each order perturbation theory, but to try to understand the full structure and try to do at least some partial resummations. In order to do that, you need clean perturbation theory. Uh, that's a strong motivation for this post Minkowski approach. You get a much cleaner uh, perturbation theory compared to post Newtonian. Uh, there's uh, radiation spin. This is a very hot topic. Everybody's working on this, including us, which is stopping us from working on that. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, finite size effects um, uh, would be another thing. And we should expect many more advances. So the summary is particle physics uh, gives us a new way to think about problems of current interest in general relativity. Uh, this double copy idea gives us a unified framework for gravity and gauge theory. I showed you some applications. There's this web of theories, which I didn't speak about very much, but you can look at our review article. Uh, we have a giant section on this web of theories. Uh, so it, it describes different relations between theories that look like they're not related to each other. High order, calculate, uh, high order explorations of supergravity, especially in the ultraviolet. That's something I explained in uh, a little bit of detail. This two-body Hamiltonian for gravitational radiation, what I spent uh, quite a bit of time on. And, and that looks really promising also for the future for what can be done. Uh, so the final summary is we can expect many more advances in the coming years, not only for gravitational wave physics, but more generally for understanding gravity 
and its relations to the other forces through the double copy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. So we have time for questions. Excuse me, what is the difference between gravity and supergravity? And where applies one and where applies the other? Right, and where apply the first and where applies the other? So, from our point of view, a supergravity is not different from gravity. It's just a theory of gravity with some matter thrown in. It's thrown in in some special way so that you get extra cancellations and extra symmetry. But as far as like the logic of how you attack the problem, how you think about the problem, there's no difference. Gravity itself generally is more complicated than supergravity, simply because these extra states uh, cause cancellations of complicated pieces. Any other more questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, that when that you can use potentials and expand. Well, you can expand. You're trying to expand general relativity in potentials and several other other terms. And also, you mentioned the effective field methods. But are these methods useful for exploring high energy things about gravity like singularities in black holes, or does this break at the ultraviolet behavior? Well, I, I'm a little unsure how to answer this. So the, each, for, every problem, for every problem you're interested uh, in, in physics, uh, roughly speaking, there's an effective field theory, an appropriate effective field theory for studying that problem. This, effective, this particular effective the field theory is specifically designed, whoops, I can't do this. Well, okay, <laughs> there's a black hole, there's another one. It, it's specifically designed for this problem of figuring out the, the conservative potential between two black holes. If you're interested in another problem, you'd probably want to design some very different effective field theory. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I was really interested especially to see how you can calculate this enormous number of, of diagrams that come would naively appear to come from the perturbative expansion. But my question is related to that because although I agree that there may be, say, 10 to the 31 diagrams that you... No, I didn't say 10 to the 1 diagram. I said 10 to the 31 terms in one diagram. Okay, so 10 to the 31 terms in one diagram. Are you calculating all of those terms with this technique, or are you calculating only the UV divergent? Um, so we, we, construct, we construct all the, so well, first we're doing, at five loops we do it in N equals eight supergravity, so that immediately causes an enor enormous, uh, uh, cancellation, um, enormous cancellation. The integrand that we construct is for everything. It's the entire integrand. Uh, of course there are not 10 to the 30th terms in that thing, because that thing has been highly cleaned. And the basic trickery that makes it clean is you use the cleanliness of n equals four super Yang mills to then import that cleanliness so that you get reasonable expressions in, uh, for the integrand of n equals eight supergravity. Then when we integrate this thing, then we only integrate it for the ultraviolet divergent terms. Uh, but at least we get past the problem that if you uh, want to inspect whether a term is ultraviolet divergent and you have 10 to the 31, you'd have a lot of trouble going through those terms. Here, you just sweep over the terms and you pick out the ones that contribute and then you, uh, you, you basically do a series expansion in the ultraviolet and work out the integrals. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, in the potential, 
uh, the higher orders uh, started looking simpler and simpler. Uh, is that uh, right and um, why? Simpler, uh, no, the higher, well, uh, I, in some way they're getting relatively simpler in the sense compared to what you might have expected. But the, where's my thing? So the first term, I mean, this first term is pretty simple. Uh, the third term, so this is the term we worked out. It has a, a new type of structure. There's a log, this arc cinch is really a logarithm. Um, so you could say maybe that's more complicated. Um, but I wouldn't say it's getting simpler and simpler. I'm saying that, I guess what I'm saying is I can fit this thing on a page, and I'm even better, I can fit this thing in my head, and I can start thinking about the general structure of this thing. I, I was uh, looking, I think, uh, two slides after this one. Uh, oh. Oh, so. Oh, may, oh, no, no, no. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> no, 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 they, they drop it. This is post-Newtonian. So <laughs> the reason why uh, it looks um, simpler is because they drop the mess. Uh, so uh, if they go to the next, so if they go to the uh, fifth post-Newtonian and they start picking up terms like g to the fourth plus velocity, then it gets much more complicated. So, uh, so it, de it definitely does not get uh, simpler as you go on. Uh, the reason why I pointed this out is because we are not sensitive to those terms. We're sensitive to everything else. It's just I was too, yeah, I was running out of time, so I, I didn't explain, oh, we lost these terms. So uh, when the comparison is done, there's an overlap. So they have some pieces that we don't have, because it's higher order in G. Uh, and we have pieces they don't have, because we have all orders in velocity. But the overlap part is the... Uh, we, we agree perfectly on. And that's, you could say, the most complicated of what they have. Yeah, actually, that's a good catch because it looks a little weird. How could it be that higher order stuff <laughs> gets? Yeah. Okay, so we have the last question there because otherwise we're going to finish very, very late. So please. Oh. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. Professor, do you know if. if uh, Having this nice relation uh, about um, young Mills and gravity and the perturbative level are, are apply also in the non-perturbative regime? Or? Well, luckily, our next speaker can say something about that. Okay. So he will be looking at classical solutions of, uh, I, I guess it's the black hole ones that he'll be looking at. Okay. Um, so anyway, we should just wait for the next talk and you'll have at least a partial answer. So I think the answer is stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We thank uh, Zvibern again. Please. So we have now to switch to Andres Luna. So, 
Uh, let's continue with the next talk by uh, Andres Luna, who is now at the University of California in Los Angeles again. So the square root of a black hole. Thank you. So uh, thanks so much for the uh, introduction. Um, and let me start by thanking the organizers, uh, Lorenzo and Luis Felipe, for putting together this uh, great meeting. I know this is usually part of a script, just thanking the organizers, but in this case, I really mean it. <laughs> because um, it, it, I know it was a great effort uh, to uh, bring uh, the people and uh, invite me as well. So uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I really like that people are getting interested in this stuff. So um, I went for the flashy title, uh, what is the square root of a black hole? Um, a, a better title might have been uh, the classical double copy, a bias review. So I will talk about uh, some uh, ideas that I've been involved with, um, all of them uh, trying to apply uh, the double copy to classical systems. So um, about it, uh, this is based on many papers by a lot of people. Um, most of them are credited. Uh, it is not inclusive, so I'm sure I forgot some papers. Uh, I hope I don't lose any friends. So um, it might be a little uh, over ambitious uh, with, the, uh, with my slides, uh, but so I will try to go fast, but feel free to stop me. Um, and I, I will tell you if you want to uh, ask a question um, in Spanish. I also speak Spanish, so uh, don't be afraid. It's better than uh, <laughs> it's better to speak Spanish than to uh, live with the with the doubt. So this is a very tough spot. Um, I, I do have some experience having uh, last or next to last uh, talks, but I had never spoken after a plenary, so it's um, truly really difficult. Uh, I will do my best. So just to break the ice, um, around 12 years ago, I was in this uh, very room. Um, you can see some of um, that uh, wall. So um, that's me. The world looks different now. Um, so Garcia Colin uh, has passed. Um, my hair is no longer that black. Um, Physics looks different. So what happened in the last decade? Uh, I think it was marked by two major uh, experimental discoveries. Uh, one of them was the Higgs boson, uh, discovered in 2012. The other is gravitational waves, discovered in 2016. Um, it is not surprising that uh, there were Nobel Prizes for both of them. So if you've been here since the morning, you know that uh, the field of scattering amplitudes is closely related to uh, collider physics. After all, it's kind of the origin of why we are computing amplitudes. Um, what is a bit more surprising is what you heard in the last hour, that uh, the field of scattering amplitudes, quantum scattering amplitudes, is somehow related to gravitational waves. So <coughs> one of the nice things of speaking this late is that uh, a lot of people did the heavy lifting of introducing the subject for me. So I can just uh, give you a brief summary. So what do we do usually to compute scattering amplitudes? Just draw every diagram that can contribute to that uh, process to a certain order that we want. Um, apply Feynman rules that comes from a, a Lagrangian and sum uh, the, the value of all of the diagrams. So what is the problem? There are too many diagrams, uh, and even in one single diagram, there can be too many terms, as we said. So the, the name of the game is efficiency. Recycle, uh, you've seen this in uh, a few talks. So um, one thing that can be done is uh, you can construct big trees. <laughs> There's a typo there, out of small trees. Or uh, what has been discussed more, you can compute uh, loop information starting from uh, truth. This is called generalized unitarity. But uh, as someone said, this is nothing that you couldn't achieve uh, if you had infinite time and an infinite number of uh, students. So one of the uh, nicest things about uh, the field of scattering amplitudes is 
the, the surprises that were there, so the hidden structures. We heard uh, the last hour about the BCJ double copy. Um, but then the double copy uh, is now used like a generic uh, way to refer to this uh, gravity equals gauge square paradigm. So there you have uh, some gluons, some amplitudes of gluons, and a collider uh, there. And then you have some amplitudes with uh, gravitons and some astronomical object there. Maybe a black hole, I'm not sure. So at some point, um, someone asked if you could uh, consider also uh, classical solutions um, coming from the double copy. So there is this paper, uh, 2014, by Chris White, Donald O'Connor, Ricardo Montero. Chris White was my, my supervisor in, uh, in the PhD in Glasgow. So what they do is they start with a family of metrics that are in, that are in what is called a Kerschel form. Um, this is the graviton. You simply uh, um, split the metric into a background metric, which is Minkowski, and uh, whatever is on top of that is your graviton. But that, for the Kerschel uh, metrics, will factorize as a scalar field and a product of vectors. These vectors have some special properties. Um, namely, it is null and geodetic. I will not say what is that. But the important part of this is that the Ricci tensor then is linear. Um, so you know, uh, one would expect that uh, you have a lot of nonlinearity in uh, Einstein equation, but because of this, uh, you will have something that is actually linear in the graviton. So what? There you have your linear Ricci tensor. So it was noted by uh, Donald and Chris and Ricardo that if you consider the solution to be stationary, so that every uh, time derivative vanishes, then you can pick some of the components uh, of the Ricci tensor, and uh, so the zero zero or the I zero will give you this. If you define a vector field in this form, just as a product of uh, k mu with phi, you can see that these two will ensemble into this equation. So if this, is, uh, if this equals zero, which is Einstein equation, will imply that the vector field written like this satisfies Maxwell equation. So you are showing that starting from a gravity solution uh, in some specific, specific form, you can construct a vector field that will satisfy uh, Maxwell-like equations. So what does it have to do with double copy? It's where the colors help. Ah. Funny color palette. Um, so uh, what you heard from SV is that you can write the amplitude in gauge theory uh, as a sum of having the uh, numerators with con which contain all of the kinematic information times the color information and there you have the propagators. So, if you satisfy color kinematics duality, which I forgot there, um, then you can only strip the color and get a second copy of the kinematic information, and you obtain gravity. So, what they found is something similar. You have a vector field, well, you start uh, here with the, with the metric, and you consider that it has two copies of the vector, which is like a kinematic information, and then the, uh, the scalar. You construct a vector field which has some color factor there. Um, you keep the uh, scalar uh, without change and take only one copy of the kinematics. So by seeing this parallel, uh, they argued that um, this could be a manifestation of the uh, double copy, of the BCJ double copy. Um, in the paper, they have some uh, arguments based, based, for example, in the uh, self-dual case. Um, and they give some examples uh, with some usual solutions. For example, the Schwarzschild black hole, which can be written uh, in Kerschel form. This is just the scalar, there is your vector, which will be null and geodetic. Then they make that uh, double, co double copy-like replacement. And after a gauge transformation, they obtain the Coulomb potential. So if someone asks you, what is the square root of the Schwarzschild black hole? You could say, that's the Coulomb potential. So easy. Um, 
There are several uh, extensions to uh, this very nice, very, um, very specific idea. So the first one, um, just a few months after the original paper, uh, we looked at the uh, tab not space time. Um, then a nice things happen when uh, some other people start working on the on the things that you were working. Then we made a lot of um, other papers. Those are the ones that have been involved with. But recently, a lot of people have been interested in that. People that I have never heard of. So, uh, that is always cool. Um, for the people interested in GR in the audience, I would recommend this one uh, because it is not as specific as Kershaw. So this works with uh, type D space times um, in terms of the bile, uh, the bile spinner actually. So one of the objections to Kershaw is that it is a very gauge specific uh, um, uh, technique, but uh, not for uh, this type D double copy, which is not the Kershaw double copy, but they work as it should work for the overlap. Okay, so when people mention something about uh, double copy and, um, and black holes, people said, wouldn't it be cool if we could apply that uh, to um, gravitational wave problems? So if you were uh, listening a few minutes ago, you know that the part where it could be applicable is in spiral phase where you can apply perturbation techniques. But what we have said so far is stationary, so it wouldn't help for an in spiral, and it is also non-perturbative. Okay, so let's uh, think about this, these two things. So obviously Chris and Ricardo and uh, Donald weren't the first to think about how to relate uh, scattering amplitude flag uh, things with, um, with classical solutions. Uh, that has been uh, there since the 70s. And one important reference here is uh, a paper by Mike Doff in 72. So what does he do? He computes uh, the vacuum expectation value of the field, which is like a, a, a one, um, one field uh, amplitude. In the presence of sources, these sources are stationary. And he shows that he reproduces uh, to second order in the Newton constant, the Schwarzschild solution by uh, applying uh, Feynman rules um, for gravity. So that's the first order in G. Um, that is the second order in G corresponds to this um, to this graph. But for the third order, he doesn't compute it. And he has this paragraph saying, um, no attempt is made to compute the four point graph or higher order contributions because of the labor involved. So before we uh, mock the guy too much because of that, um, if we didn't show it uh, full, that is the expanded three graviton vertex. So the one that had the P3 and the P6 and the, and the sim, that is the full expression. It is 171 terms. Each one of these terms looks like that. And the four graviton vertex, which would have been needed for the computation back there, has almost 3,000 terms. So uh, being in the 70s, uh, uh, we understand why uh, he, he didn't do it. So almost 3,000 terms. There you go. Or as Sheldon would say, a gravity. You are a heartless bitch. But you've been sitting here for the last hour, so you know what B says. If you can read the arms, it says color equals kinematics. So it's color and equals kinematics. Or gravity equals gauge squared. Or it doesn't have to be a bitch. It doesn't have to be more difficult than gauge theory. So then we obtained a perturbative space times, uh, pretty much like Duff, but from Jan Mills theory. So going back to something that's be said, we don't have to resort to uh, gravity to obtain all of that information. And we can easily, almost back of the envelope, compute uh, all the way to um, the next order. We define this uh, field 
which we call uh, the fat graviton, that H, which is like the square of a photon. So how do we do it? Instead of using the uh, 171 terms uh, vertex, we use a double copy vertex, which is just the square of the Young Mills. And we compute order by order, perturbatively. And after some computation that I tell you is not that long, we go all the way to third order. But what did we, what did we compute here? So for Duff, it was uh, really clear what was he computing. It's almost obvious because he's doing uh, pure gravity and this is stationary and spherically symmetric. So it has to be Schwarzschild. But we are not sure what we have to hear because what is the theory we are uh, dealing with? So as I said, we have this field that we call a fat graviton, which is like the square of uh, gluons. And a gluon has two degrees of freedom. So if you square it, you expect something like four degrees of freedom. But we know that the graviton only has two. That's why it's fat. It has too many degrees of freedom to be a graviton. So then you have to, um, you have your degrees of freedom. That's the real graviton. That's a dilaton. And that's a uh, anti-symmetric form. And this is something that uh, will be present if you naively uh, double copy uh, pure Young Mills. So then we need a map to split degrees of freedom. So then we can give them in terms of our, our fat graviton. And we can check if we make an expansion that we are reproducing the first orders of the Janis Newman winning solution, um, which is a solution which has a metric and a scalar field uh, coupled there. So um, in the limit where you turn off that scalar, that reduces to, to Schwarzschild. So it is everything perfectly consistent. But it's still stationary, and we want things to move. If we are ever to apply to uh, a spiral of black holes, we need things to, to be moving. We didn't do this. Um, it was Walter Goldberg and Alex Ridway who first uh, took a step towards that. So what they do is uh, they have a set of equations of motion describing point color charges that couple to gluons. And it's just classical physics. Uh, just because these are uh, coupled differential uh, equations, it's very difficult to solve analytically. We don't know if it can be done. But you can just solve uh, perturbatively. So you consider that you have a color chart with an initial state and then a correction. And you have a position with an initial, um, initial form and then a correction. And then you just um, rewrite your equation of motion, crank the turn. So because they are doing some perturbation thing, uh, you can see that solving the equation of motion, it can be codified by diagrams that look a lot, are a lot like Feynman diagrams. But this is just doing classical physics. So after uh, obtaining the, um, the first contribution to the radiation, they obtain an expression like that. It is in terms of uh, color charges and the velocity of the particles. And they can do the same thing for a gravity theory. Actually, a dilaton gravity. It will be clear why they are doing that. But then you have uh, this, which is like um, that uh, Einstein Hilbert, and uh, then you couple the, the, gravito, uh, the dilaton. Um, and then you have the coupling to the point particles. And again, solve perturbatively your equations of motion and obtain what is the uh, radiation of graviton. So what? Um, recall from the double copy, what we saw before, that you can have your amplitude for gravity, um, which has two copies of kinematics, and the one for a gauge that has color and kinematics. So in principle, you obtain gravity by stripping off color and substituting with kinematics. They propose something like that. This is the expression that I showed you before. And they say that where they see a color charge, they substitute with momentum. And where they see the uh, structure constant, they substitute with the Young Mills vertex. They do that substitution, obtain these results, and this, this contains all dilaton gravity information. 
So then they say this is a manifestation of the uh, classical double copy. Remember, this is something that came only from uh, classical physics. It's like a world line computation. It does look like color goes to kinematics, but it's a bit different from what we are used to. Um, people kept writing papers about this using the same replacement here. So charge goes to momentum, uh, structure constant goes to vertex. Pretty much all of them are like that. Most of them are uh, Walters. Uh, there is some David Chester and uh, Mariana Carrillo and others. But of all of the, of the extensions of this, the nicest one is that one. And I can tell you objectively, not just because this guy is my office mate. This is because he found color kinematics duality in a classical system, um, which is, if not shocking, uh, at least really, really nice. I don't think we were expecting this to uh, be as, uh, as nice as it was. But we needed to understand why uh, that happened before. This was not the route that we followed. Instead, we wanted to understand things in terms of amplitudes. So we will compute radiation coming from an amplitude. That's an amplitude for uh, four scalars emitting uh, one gluon or eventually one graviton. What do we do? We start with a Lagrangian. We use Feynman rules because there, because there are not that many diagrams. This is not so difficult. It's just a three-level amplitude. Just obtain that uh, amplitude. It is there. Write it in the form that uh, is compatible with BCJ. And we will see that we will have color kinematics duality almost for free. So then we can obtain gravity for free. And from here, we see that taking the classical limits uh, using a large mass expansion, we can reproduce um, the result for dilaton gravity that was given by Goldberger and Ridway using Warline. So this, could, uh, this is nice because then it is transparent uh, why it has to, to work like that. It is just actual uh, double copy, the statement for quantum amplitudes, and then take the large mass uh, expansion. So just after we have used the uh, double copy that is well established, we will take the classical limits. So this was extended uh, to a program to obtain uh, physical observables from scattering amplitudes. Uh, this was done by uh, Donald um, and David Kosauer, who is a long-time collaborator of uh, SB and, and Lance, and Ben maybe who's a student of, of Donald. So they give this kind of formulas uh, where they carefully define uh, how to obtain the classical limit of the um, physical observables in terms of the scattering amplitude. That is just the quantum scattering amplitude as we know it, but then you have uh, some systematic framework to translate this into classical information. Um, they do this for the impulse, which is the uh, change of, of momentum in a scattering process. They do also this for the radiation. Um, you can actually show that by using this systematic framework, we can reproduce what we have here uh, from a, um, a, much, a, a much more pragmatic way of taking the, the classical limits. Um, there have been expansion, uh, extensions to this formalism by Gavar Ocher of Bynes to uh, the spin case. Also, um, Donald and Bynes and, and maybe first saw the, uh, the spin case. So, going back to the uh, title of the, of the talk, so about what is the square root of a rotating black hole? Um, in a recent paper, this is just uh, last summer, which is called Curved Black Holes as Elementary Particles. This is uh, Nimar Kani Hamed and Yutin Huang and uh, Donald O'Connell. Um, you can show that uh, for the, um, for the Kirchhoff form, you can have the scalar for Schwarzschild to be of this form. That is just uh, Schwarzschild radius. And you can have the one for Kerr being in this form. So you can see that they are related by a complex shift. 
Then, um, he, using the uh, Kirchhoff double copy, gives a solution for Young Nelson in this form. And he goes uh, beyond uh, that flashy talking about uh, the square root of, of black holes. He actually starts using that root care uh, name. Let's see if it catches. Um, but anyway, using that root care, he shows that, um, well, just uh, before, this uh, paper about Kerr black holes as elementary particles, it builds on a formalism to give a massive spin or helicity for arbitrary spin. And it winds up relating uh, the minimal coupling, uh, that notion of minimal coupling, which is very different to what one would think uh, minimal coupling is. Here they relate this minimal coupling to the Kerr black hole, to how uh, the massive particle has to have to be coupled to behave like a like a Kerr black hole. And similarly, you can have something which is like the uh, root Kerr, having here um, the the boson to be uh, photons instead of uh, instead of gravitons. So then uh, Donald using that uh, his formalism checks what is the impulse for root care, and what is the impulse uh, coming from uh, minimal coupling, and he sees that uh, this is the same thing. So this is another link of what we had before, which is the uh, Kerr shield double copy, to a double copy which is properly one because it's written in terms of, of scattering amplitudes. And there have been some extensions to, uh, to that in recent literature. Again, this is only uh, last summer, so uh, it's a, an, active, um, an active area. Yeah, just to mention that there are other classical double copies out there. Uh, for example, uh, Jan Plevka along with uh, Jan Steinhoff, uh, they were working on uh, something that goes directly to the effective action. So instead of looking uh, at classical solutions, they go for the effective action and they try to understand that uh, in terms of the effective action of uh, Jan Mills. This is the first paper that they, uh, that they um, got out. Um, the next one is called a breakdown of the classical double copy. So it, it didn't last long. Uh, there are other things relating direct, directly uh, the classical solutions in a linearized level. Uh, this is similar to what uh, we were doing before solving perturbatively. Um, this, is for, um, this is for young Mills and it comes from a program that uh, Dove started that wants to relate the symmetries in, in both theories. Um, so I started saying that we need to be cool to apply to uh, gravitational waves. So now we know that it is cool. Uh, we have uh, a whole half a talk about that from, from Zvi. Um, I don't say much because you, you saw it, but uh, they have the uh, 3 p.m., the Tirposmikovsky uh, and Hamiltonian uh, for binary systems. Um, and not only that, uh, this has, uh, this is also something interesting for uh, the proper uh, LIGO theorists. Um, so people are working, are looking at this. Uh, it is a very active area of research right now. So just some um, conclusions and an outlook. So there are several classical manifestations of the double copy. Um, there are some links, with, some links with black hole dynamics which make it potentially applicable to a uh, gravitational wave. Uh, astronomy. And the outlook, there's still lots of work to be done, uh, too much to uh, enumerate here, uh, and there are lots of paths to, to explore. So um, this is me, thank you. Thank you very much, Andres. So we have, well, yes. So I think a lot of these square roots of these uh, smooth gravity solutions maybe are more Coulomb or Maxwell solutions than really yang mill solutions. Is that true? Um, it's true-ish. So what happens is that um, what we obtain is a linearized uh, yang mills uh, which you can uh, effectively embed into, into a Maxwell-like solution. So, but this could be an artifact, or it is an artifact, uh, of the Kerr-Schultz uh, ansatz. 
because Kirchfeld is linearizing uh, the, the, Ricci, the Ricci tensor. Sure. So I don't have it, uh, I have it here. Um, so we take that uh, color to be constant, and then when you have uh, the structure constants hitting those, uh, those color charges, because they are constant and symmetry and anti-symmetry, you, you kill all of the, all of the effects. So um, yes, it is true that if you are working in this care shield frame, you will obtain things that are only linearized young mills or effectively um, Maxwell. But there are other ways to approach uh, the classical double copy that will keep all of the information of, of young mills. Because I also heard a talk at QCD Meets Gravity which argued that maybe you needed ghost sources as well to uh, uh, this was properly... This Sylvia or...? Yeah. Yes. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, so their answers uh, are more complete that, than uh, what we are considering. So um, it's similar to what uh, we do at some point there. So we have a double copy here uh, that solves um, young meals and then we square it and then uh, you obtain uh, gravity. This is only uh, pure young meals with, with gluons. Um, but uh, she shows that um, you can have extended uh, dictionaries, they, they call it, on how to map the degrees of freedom from, um, from young meals, also including ghosts, to the degrees of freedom of, uh, of gravity. So um, one, could one could think of this as being just a more restrictive uh, way of doing a double or single copies. Thank you. So, so I think that uh, was the last one. Voy a hacer la pregunta en español. Muy bien. ¿Cuál es el objetivo, el objeto de determinar la raíz cuadrada del el agujero negro? Y dos, ¿sí? ¿En qué momento este agujero negro se convierte en un cuásar? ¿O qué tiempo tarda? Um. Supongo que respondo en español. Eh, sobre el objetivo, la idea es que eh, gravedad es difícil. La gravedad es difícil. Eh, hacer cálculos en gravedad es difícil, porque eh, si uno empieza con un eh, lagrangiano, entonces tiene muchos términos. O las ecuaciones de Einstein son eh, no lineales y eh, están acopladas etc. Todo el programa de doble copia, eh, su idea es aprovechar la, eh, que la teoría de norma es mucho menos compleja que la gravedad. Entonces, eso es lo que se quiere aprovechar. Y esto posiblemente no es eh, tan eh, útil como lo que está haciendo Svi, que es directamente atacar el problema. Eh, aquí nada más estamos divirtiéndonos, jugando con las implicaciones de la, eh, de la doble copia. Eh, quizá no hay un objetivo, eh, la idea era ver cuál era el alcance y quizá en algún momento podríamos aprovechar eh, que la teoría de norma es, es menos complicada. Entonces, eso. Sobre la segunda pregunta, eh, demostraré mi ignorancia y no voy a decir nada porque no sé, eh, no tengo ni idea de, eh, lo que, de la respuesta a lo que me está preguntando. So we have to stop because otherwise we're going to run in very late. So we thanks Andres again. Thank you.
Du sagst nicht Stop. Um, stop. Wait. He's not going to talk. No. <laughs> stop the case. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a tremendous honor to be here in this beautiful lecture hall. I would like to say thank you to the organizer for giving me this great opportunity to present my work. Uh, I'm going to talk about Gravitino Amplitudes and Stop the Case. This work is in collaboration with Lorenzo Diaz Cruz that is also here. Okay, I, I'm going to start with the motivation that is basically uh, physics beyond the standard model, searches for physics beyond the standard model. And then I will move uh, quickly to Gravitino and Gustino in interaction in order to compute Gravitino amplitude using the, the so-called new methods like the spin or elicit formalis for massive particles and also the, I will show the, the, my last calculation using the, the trace technology just to compare. And finally, some concluding remarks. Okay. Okay, my motivation is almost the same than the first lecture from Lance Stahl, but let me remind you for that we know that the standard model for particle physics is a very successful description of the phenomena at TeV scale. However, there are several open, open issues of the standard model that seem to call for new physics. Just to mention some of them are the hierarchy problem, and cannot unify gauge coupling, and also there is no dark matter uh, candidate. So, um, some natural candidate to, to theory to solve this problem is supersymmetry, that is a symmetry that unified boson with fermions, and it's also a unique extension of Poincare space-time symmetry. In, super, in, in supersymmetry, you can moderate the hierarchy problem, and um, let me point out that also provide a good candidate for, for dark matter. Uh, the, the idea is, this, the basic idea is that in supersymmetry, or uh, um, in this minimal supersymmetric standard model, uh, um, you have for every boson of, of, the, of the standard model um, a super partner. That is, for example, take the, the, the gluons, you have the gluino, and the same idea uh, is also true. If you study the local version of supersymmetry, uh, gravity appears, and, and the super partner of the graviton is the gravitino. Uh, let me say that within these SUSI models, the lightest supersymmetrical particle is a viable dark matter candidate. And if you want to study this model, the nature of the next to lightest supersymmetrical particle, because the LSP is, is stable and, and cannot decay, the, the next to lightest supersymmetric particle determines the, 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 the supersymmetric phenomenology. So uh, there are several candidates for, for, for the lightest supersymmetrical particle and also for the next to the lightest supersymmetrical particle. Uh, the most popular show is the neutralino for, for, the, for the LSP, but uh, still another option is the gravitino. Um, in such case, the gravitino is also a viable dark matter candidate. Uh, for, the, for the NLSP, uh, there are also several candidates. I, I will, I will uh, point out the stop, the scalar top, the super panel of the quark top. Uh, and each of these has its own distinct phenomenology. This has been studied for these people. Uh, okay, so we can obtain the, the gravitino interaction in, in, in the minimal supersymmetric standard model as is usual. We can derive from the supergravity Lagrangian. You can take the, the best bigger textbooks. For example, uh, the, the gravitino interaction with color field, field, fields. Uh, can be derived from these Lagrangians, and also the, the, the Gravitino interaction with the vector fields. So we are almost done. We can compute some observables. You have to, rem to keep in mind that the Gravitino is a spin three half particle, and in this model is a very weakly interacting particle. So a good candidate for, for dark matter. Um, there is also uh, this high energy equivalence theorem between the gravitino and the Goldstino, that is, for example, the high energy, the high energy limit, the spin three half gravitino could be approximate to the Goldstino. The Goldstino is a Majorana uh, spinner, so uh, the Feynman rules 
uh, are very are very easy compared with the gravitino. So for technical reasons, people are, have been using the Goldstino in this approximation. I will show some explicit calculation. For example, um, this channel when the 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 stop decay to the three body the stop decay where the stop decay to the bottom to the to the W and to the gravitino, you have to take into account these three Feynman diagrams. Uh, let me. And you have here the vertices. This was first computed by Lorenzo and John Ellis. They approximate this, this vertice because I suppose for technical reasons, I will show you the, the, the complete calculation and also I will uh, uh, compare with the Goldstein approximation using the first the trace technology as is usual in the, in the quantum field theory courses in, in, in Gravity programs in physics. For example, uh, if you, you want to, to compute the, 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 the the observable you have using the trace technology, you have to, to square it and then average the amplitude that's using the trace technology. But you can see here that, for example, when you have the gravitino, the problem is that you have this tensor uh, and that is the, the completeness relation that is, is very huge. And even using um, mathematica with the uh, full simplification, it's very difficult. You have to separate all these trays. Uh, it's very involved to compute. Uh, sorry. We have also a similar problem you computing the interference of, of, of the diagrams, but, uh, sorry, it's not working. Okay, let me show you the final result using the trace technology for this three body stop decay. Uh, this is the, remember this is the square amplitude. Uh, we want to have analytical expression in order to have a control, but using the trace technology, you have huge expression as, 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 as is usual. Uh, we would like to have a, a better uh, techniques in order to compute uh, gravitino amplitudes. Uh, but even in this case, uh, we can compare the, 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 the three body stop decay with the gravitino in the final stage uh, with the full calculation uh, and the approximation that Ellis uh, uh, did with Lorenzo and also with the Goldstein. You can see that for, 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 for the low energy or, um, limit, or in other words, when the mass of the, the gravitino is very low, the, 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 the 3D case are almost the same. We only, at this level, using trace technology, we only have comparison in the numerical analysis. We would like to, to have a better, as I said, a better uh, method to compute that. As, so in the program of, 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 of computing amplitude, you have to draw all the dry, diagrams, and write down the amplitudes. I would like to stop here. and. We can use the powerful method that flow from the uh, amplitude community, for example, the spin or elicited formalis, uh, and, and, and you can you can avoid to square it. Uh, uh, as, as you will see, this method is very powerful. Just uh, let me show you very quickly what is the main idea of, of the spin or elicited formalis. Basically, you want to express the external moment of every particle in the interaction in terms of, of, of two component spinners. This is for the massless case. So in other words, you want to express your amplitudes in terms of uh, a better kinematical variables in order to, 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 to improve your, 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 your calculation and compute very fast and, and, and very efficiently. And you can read even in the pesking, for example, this, this um, 
product of, of, of Dirac spinner. And when you replace it by the two component um, by the spinner, you obtain that the momentum could be expressed as, as, as the product of two, of two, two, two component spinner. So the main idea is, is use this new, new um, for example, you can express this product, there are the large invariant quantities in terms of these new, uh, let's say, um, variables, and you use these new um, labels, for example, the square um, uh, and, and angle product, and express all your amplitude using the, the traditional Feynman rules in terms of this product, and, 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 and and we already have all the, the new Feynman rules, for example, for, for the spinner and also the polarization vector. You can notice that uh, we are working at, at the beginning with the two degree of freedom of the polarization vector. We, we, we are avoiding the, the redundance of use gates, uh, redundance in order to, 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 to reduce the, the two degree of freedom that the polarization vector has in, in traditional methods. Uh, this is called Chinese mic for was done for these people. So, uh, in order to compute, you have to use these uh, basis identities. For example, the, the, the products are, 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 are an, an antisymmetric, and you, you can obtain or, 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 uh, the minus alkyne variables just having this kind of product. Also, uh, the reflection and identity. Also, you have, for example, the, the first identity without any uh, 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 um, spin or indices, so it's, it's very, very, very amazing. And also you have momentum conservation in terms of this spin or pro. So if you want to see a very nice introduction, you can read the, the Lance Dixon uh, lecture. Uh, there are, I think this is more, more new. Okay, but we want to compute amplitude with massive gravitino. We also have the, the, the Feynman rules uh, for massive particles. You, you can notice that something that is very nice is that you can express the, the spinner even when, uh, when they have the mass in terms of this massless two component spinner. So we can use, okay, we can, we can use the, the, all the amazing, um, all the amazing identity that we already showed for the massless case. The idea is very simple. You, you express, you use like on the composition in order to express a massive momenta in terms of two masses momenta. And, and, and we can, as I said, uh, we can uh, compute all the massive amplitude as, as massless, as I will show you. Okay, this, this, this started with the Meyer, and also you can read this, this paper from Stephen Weiser. Okay, let me do some checks in order to get confidence before we start with the gravitino amplitudes, uh, uh, you can compute, for example, textbook's problem, or for example, take the, the Higgs decay to two fermions, uh, build the, the, the amplitude using the, 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 the traditional way at this level from the Lagrangian, you can build the amplitude, then use the spin elicity formalism, and you can see that even in the massive case, we obtain uh, elicity amplitude very compact. and, and uh, 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 after squaring, we reproduce the very well-known results. So very nice. We can have a more complicated Feynman diagrams with the polarization vectors in the intermediate state. And still, we have very compact elicity amplitudes. And because all the properties of the spinner products, they are antisymmetric, etc., we can notice very quickly, even before to square the amplitude, the spurious uh, degrees of let me say degrees of freedom, but in fact, there are the, this conf elicity configuration. And again, we reproduce the very well-known results. So we can move to, to our problem and, and, and build the, the, the gravitino or Feynman rules using these modern methods. And we, we already know that from, from the solution of the rarita schinger equation that there are four states for the gravitino. And something that is very nice is that the gravitino is, is expressed in terms of, 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 of uh, polarization vectors and, and spinners. And we already know how to express these quantities in terms of, 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 
of these new variables, so we can we can we can uh, rewrite all 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 the list, all the all the gravitinos uh, states in terms of these new variables, and and then check some some very well known results from the literature. For example, this computation was first done by uh, Jonathan Fenn, the the neutralino uh, decay to gravitino and also to 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 the photon. Uh, you can see that even even in in, in the massive case. Uh, the amplitudes, the elicity amplitude are very compact. For example, we only have these two configurations for elicity. Uh, this first column is the complete amplitude, that means the, for the complete gravitino, and this is considering the, the Goldstein approximation. You can see at this level uh, that, for example, we, we obtain the correction uh, for the Goldstino uh, when we use the gravitino. And for, for example, this pedagogical example that also is, is very nice, for example, when annihilation of, of positron and electron to, to Goldstino, uh, for example, for the massless case, we only have these two configurations, but when, when we consider the mass, the mass of the particle, <laughs> we obtain the same uh, mass elicity amplitude with the, with the correlation of the mass, and also two new uh, elicity amplitudes. So it's, it's, it's very nice. So uh, let's uh, come back to, the, to our, to our to, to this old friend, the, the stop decays. The stop could, could de there are three modes for, for, for the stop decays with, in this model with the gravitino LSP in the final state. There is the two mode, the two decay, the three body, and the four body decay. This is the parameter space. You can see that even in the four, the two body of force is the, is the bigger one, um, but even for the four body stop decay, there is also. Uh, a considerable um, uh, region for, for the parameter space. So you can see now that, for example, if, if you compute the two body stop decay uh, with the gravitino to the ma with the massive gravitino in the final state, we have at least at, 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 in the two body stop decay very compact expression. You can see it here in this column, for example, this is the amplitude. The C here, the capital C is just just coupling constant. You can see, for for example, uh, uh, that even with the gravi the total gravitino, we have very a small a compact uh, 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 expression. And something that is very nice at this level is that, for example, uh, we found this this regular regular regularization. Let's say that the 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 Amplitude with the, this gravitino spin three half in the final state could be expressed as as this factor, uh, data factor. By data here, I mean uh, uh, this term that is, is is just a function of, of of the energy and the moment of the external particles. So, in terms of this amplitude with the Goldstino, as as you can see here, so this is very nice, and and, and it was impossible to to notice using the the, the trace technology. Okay, you can say this is at two level. Let's say what happened with uh, three body stop decay that we already compute with the trace technology. This is really amazing. We only have this this elicity amplitude. We are we 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 found again this regularization that the amplitude with the gravitino will be expressed in terms of the Goldstein approximation. Probably is the, is, is, this is the this is a result of, of the high energy equivalence between gravitino and Goldstino, but again, it's very nice to, to notice at this level. And okay, can, can we compute the, the, the four body? Yes, it's, it's, it's even simpler than, than, than the, the three body. And we found the same regularization that the amplitude with the massive gravitino could be expressed in terms of this. So you have to take into account that this amplitude in the left side is with uh, spin three half, and this is when the spin one half, and that these elicity amplitude uh, are still waiting to be square. So you know, this, all of this is at the level of, of elicity amplitude for the non square Okay, now we can do some um, numerical analysis uh, more efficiently uh, with uh, some uh, uh, non-fancy computer. Uh, because our analytical results, and we can do, uh, for example, uh, the following statement. If, for example, for the two-body uh, stop decay, 
if you want to approximate uh, the, 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 the Gravitino to Golstino, it is good. If you want, for example, to have 1% of, 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 of the accuracy, you have, to, uh, uh, you have to work in this range of the, for the mass of the Gravitino. In other case, uh, the, the, you, you, you will obtain a bigger error in your calculation. This was possible just because the, the, our analytical result is in the, 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 the spinal is the metals. This is, for example, in the three body stop decay. This is the stop, the, the life, the life uh, time of the stop, and this, the ex excess is the mass of the gravitino. For example, here, uh, if you want to have uh, accuracy of, of, of the 20%, this is the better you can, you can do. You have to take the, the mass of the gravitino uh, among 160, uh, b between 100 and, and, and 65, more or less. In other cases, also you, you, you are, your approximation is not good, so this could be a good result for cosmologists that are considering the gravitino as a dark matter candidate. And for the four body decay, we also do our analysis, numerical analysis. So the best you can do is, in, is if you want to approximate the gravitino in the final state to Golstino, you have a accuracy of 70%. So, but you have to take into account the mass of the gravitino. So it's, it's very nice to have this compact expression in terms of the mass of the gravitino because we can, we can have, uh, 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 we made an improvement in, in our an, an, an numerical analysis. So let's, I know that everyone is, is tired, so let's summarize. Uh, so the spin or the formalis is, it allows to evaluate scattering amplitude incredible simple and fast, uh, even with the spin free half gravitino in the final state. And even if you have uh, several legs in your Feynman diagrams, this is very amazing. So it, we could say now that a scenario with gravitino as lightest supersymmetrical particle and stop as a, the next to lightest supersymmetrical particle was studied in, 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 and we did some improvement to the traditional ca ca calculation. And we have, uh, uh, we have compute our commitment that was the uh, time life of, of the stop before to, to decay, even, even to the four body mold. So this is very amazing. It could have some implications in, in, in collider and cosmology. And as you see, we have compact relation between gravitino and Gostino amplitude at the three level uh, in, in, this, uh, in this moment for the two, three, and four body stop decay. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Time for questions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So we have now a question here. So, very nice. I always learn something from you. So, regarding the, the spin three half uh, gravitino, yes. I'm... I'm um, so, so I, we looked at, the, you, you know, this uh, three-quarter of a century old veloz van Seeger problem, that the, the theory for a massive spring half particle is inconsistent because it has uh, some non-causal, uh, it has faster than like propagation when it has interactions. And my understanding of this matter is that for the gravitino, this is, this is fixed by, by supersymmetry. So supersymmetry protects it from developing these this, uh, faster than like solutions. So the question is, in, in the, the way you're doing things, is there a role for, for supersymmetry in doing this? Or, or is this just because you're using non-redundant degrees of freedom? I mean, could this cure this uh, veloz van Seeger problem? Just because you don't have redundant, because the origin of the veloz van Seeger problem is that there is some ambiguity between the, the uh, spin one half degrees of freedom. It's sort of like two point carré orbits are getting mixed in a way that is not. Uh, so the, the, can you comment on this? Okay, the, 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 the method is very universal. You can use the spin or least formally for massive particles for any, for any theory, the standard model, as I, I already mentioned. But are, are, are you talking about the Gravitino-Angostino approximation? But, or, or, 
So I did not see anywhere where... Uh, so there are many ways in which these kind of problems manifest. So for example, you get uh, the wrong poles in the propagator, or you get some... There are many ways to see that, that, that there can be inconsistencies. But the way this is done, it seems that no problem could develop. I was just wondering if, if you have maybe looked at... So for example, you can do this for the delta resonance in, in QCD, which is also spin three half. And yes, th there so are some questions as to how consistent is, is the description of the delta because of this, uh, because in the way it's traditionally done, there are, there are some problems. And maybe this, I think it's very interesting to think if this can, can be applied to that and sort of evade yeah, it would this. It would be very nice if yeah. I could see the reference and, and then I could give a better okay. answer. Yes. Tengo una pregunta. Sí. ¿Qué efecto tiene este gravitino en la naturaleza o en el cuerpo humano? Puesto que se parece, los neutrinos no tienen ningún efecto nocivo sobre el cuerpo humano o sobre los objetos que atraviesa. Por favor. Muchas gracias. Muy interesante la pregunta. Como dijo Andrés, voy a contestar en español. Eh... Si en estos modelos el gravitino se considera como, como un candidato a materia oscura, que es una materia que se dice oscura porque, digamos, no interactúa de manera electro, no, no emite ni absorbe luz, que es algo que creemos es, es bastante aceptado en la comunidad científica, que de hecho el 27% aproximadamente de la materia en el universo es materia oscura. Eh, eso digamos que ya está bien establecido en la comunidad. Si el gravitino es, es, es realmente un candidato a, a ser materia oscura, esto pues, pues sería increíble porque de alguna manera sabemos qué partícula describe la materia oscura y tenemos control sobre ella. Y, 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 y en ese sentido, la pregunta suya, ¿qué efectos tienen en, en la naturaleza? Pues sería interesante, el 27% de la materia del universo la tendríamos bajo control, por decirlo así. Y eh, por el momento, eh, no sé qué efectos tendrá sobre, 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 digamos, sobre, sobre el cuerpo humano. Es, es, habría que ver primero si, si, si estamos rodeados de materia oscura, eh, la Tierra está rodeada, eso creo que es algo que todavía no se sabe. Sí. ¿Y qué relación tiene con los neutrinos? Eh, pues hay casos que, 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 que sabemos que puede interactuar de alguna manera con, con, con neutrinos, es lo más que podríamos saber, o sea, podríamos, digamos que matemáticamente, matemáticamente sabemos cómo, cómo le habla uno al otro, pero, pero, pero no es que, que el gravitino, digamos, se comporte como, como un neutrino o viceversa. Si, sabemos nada más cómo podrían interactuar entre ellos. Sí. One last question or comment. Yes. Just a question, because you showed uh, in very fine print the lifetimes of the stop and it was all very long. Ah, and I was okay. wondering, I was worried about cosmology and dumping a lot of energy into the universe through the decays after Big Bang nucleosynthesis. You mean this, or? Any, any of the plots, they were all, uh, you know, life, uh, huh? ten, 10 to the six seconds or longer, right? Everything. The lifetimes ah, were all okay, yes, yes, yes. 10 to the six seconds or longer. Yes. And I was just curious, what are the constraints on the stop lifetime from things like uh, when you put a lot of energy into the universe after Big Bang nucleosynthesis, there's yes. a danger that it changes the abundance uh, of the elements. Yeah, I know that there are some bounds from cosmology, for example, the, 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 the abundance of the, the, the relative density of the dark matter. Um, there is also big back nucleosynthesis, some bounds, but I, 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 I don't remember the, the, the I know for, from Collider that the stop uh, uh, must to have uh, bigger than 500 GeV from the Collider uh, side, but from the cosmology, in fact, I think it's, it could be very interesting uh, to see what happens. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so I think that we have to close now. So we thank Brian again. And so now we have, um, before we close uh, today, so we have some words of Lorenzo, please. And then um, from, 
Felipe, Luis Felipe. Just very briefly, I was very pleased with the meeting, especially because I saw lecturers from, not only from the U.S., Lance and SB, but also from other states in Mexico. You know, when I was a young man, everything happened in Mexico City. So now we have uh, institutes and centers outside. We had people from several states, and I was very pleased uh, about that, and also about the quality of, of the meeting. So let's hope that in the future, we manage to make more meetings of this sort, and uh, many of you can uh, come and accompany us. Thank you very much. So I just want to add that I want to thank again Luis Felipe for all the efforts to have us here and to the speakers for coming. Maybe you don't know, but SV arrived at 4 a.m. or something this morning. They are very busy, Lance too, and so we really appreciate that they are with us. I also want to thank all the local speakers. that They came from different places, from Sinaloa, uh, Colima, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a big effort that they made to prepare the talks. Uh, and uh, the group from Morelia, several students came. And in these years, in these uh, months, it's not easy to get money to come here. So I really want to thank all of them for uh, this. I. My biggest hope is that the students will appreciate the joy of doing physics and doing interesting physics, and that's if, if they get that, then the objective is fulfilled. So thank you very much to everybody. And this is just the beginning of amplitudes in Mexico. We will work very hard to, to have a school, to, to have more visitors. So. Uh, you will listen from us in the near future. I have some uh, uh, diplomas for the speakers. I will uh, just uh, give them after, after. Thank you, Lorenzo. So now, I don't know if we are going to do even like a picture or something, no? There's not going to be a picture with the speakers, no? With, uh, this, with the press. We, if you want, I don't know. If, <laughs> no, I don't know. No, I don't know. Okay, if, if so uh, Roger suggests for the speakers to uh, also because uh, be in the front of a picture, just very briefly. No, but also because. Yes.